All the edifices in their wake. Okay. Jack, there's a strong pull over there. to the roadside. Really Seen that kind of the vibrations. Stop. Stance conveys the notion that he is no ordinary the foe. The apprentice demonologist. The control rooms behind him. A steep He's road led to a formidable to house to tucked into a deep cavern of shadow. We need to disarm the yellow security lights spill in from the windows seem particularly inviting. Forcing our way through Donald seems to be Bennett, the only option. still as excited as he had been a week earlier, pulled into the driveway behind several other cars and then went inside. Grounds. Artifacts and team Bruton, a nun, and a certified public accountant. First Ed, and then Lorraine had talked. And then a man who revealed his first experience as an apprentice demonologist. Donald attributed the man's nervousness to simple anxiety over having to stand up in front of a group. But he soon realized that what the man was nervous about was his experience in accompanying Ed and Lorraine. The man, tall, Thin, Are you wearing a blue this? turtleneck sweater and a tweed sport coat with sleeves not quite long enough to cover his wrist, stabbed at the button of a tape recorder and said, I went into a room by myself with a tape recorder, so this is what I brought back. At first, all Donald could hear was ambient sound in the room, the machine itself running. But then a rapping started, slowly and faintly at first, then increasingly sharp and more frequent. Then the rapping was joined by an eerie panting sound, as if a huge animal had run out of breath. Then the rapping became gigantic in size. Donald watched the man's face pale as the tape rolled on. He also noticed that the man's left eye had developed a tape. When the man was finished, Ed began giving an impromptu lecture about some of his experiences in demonology. Seeing a crucifix literally explode when a demonic spirit focused on him. Examining a human skull used for drinking blood during satanic ceremonies. Studying a rag doll used by a demonic spirit that began to exert control over a very young girl. Watching bottles of bleach and detergent being levitated behind him as he ascended the Validating the authenticity of a psychic photograph taken in Mendon, Massachusetts that clearly shows the presence of a ghost. Ed related many other incidents, then recommended that serious students in demonology study such books as Padre Pio, The Stigmatist, by Reverend Charles M. Carty, True and False Possession, by Jean Béamit, and Poltergeist Over England, by Harry Price. At the end of the night's meeting, Donald saw the man who had spoken go up to Ed, say something softly, and then put out his hand. Ed shook it. Neither was smiling. The man then went over to the hall closet, got his coat, and left. Donald sensed what had gone on, but left it for Ed to confirm. Addressing the remaining six students, Ed said, Dean has decided to drop out. I don't think I have to tell you that his encounter at the house we took him to shook him very deeply. He said that he slept very little since that night, and that he's lost his appetite and that his wife is against him going on in demonology. I think right now he needs our prayers. So why don't we take a few minutes right now and say a short rosary for him. Donald, though not a Catholic, willingly joined, proved one thing to Janet and Jack Smarrow, that the Warrens were right. Ed and Lorraine had told them that the demon, he didn't dwell on it. That night, Janet and the kids all went to the recreation hall to play bingo. At the time, Don was 16, Kim was 14, the twins were nine, and their cousin Davy was fourteen. Indeed. The youngsters got along well, and they enjoyed doing things with Janet. When it became dark, Jack decided to build a fire. Uh... About 9.15 p.m., the wood crackled and the blaze got stronger. Simon was sitting by Jack when the... Except this time, Simon growled and looked over towards the bushes. Jack turned his head toward the bushes, and to his astonishment, there was a teenage girl standing there, about 14 years old, with long blonde hair almost to her waist, and dressed in a long colonial-style dress. The girl was standing about 30 feet from Jack near the road and by the bushes. Jack saw her clearly. She was looking at him and smiling. Mm. Simon continued to growl, and Jack didn't understand this because Simon has a friendly disposition and likes youngsters. Almost transfixed, Jack stared at the girl, and she continued to smile back without moving. After about ten seconds, the girl vanished into thin air. A few seconds later, she reappeared, then quickly disappeared again. Jack thought that someone might be playing a trick on him. He went into the van and brought out a large flashlight with a four-inch circumference beam. 
Jack looked over to the bushes, and the girl was back again. She just stood there motionless, smiling at Jack. With Simon growling, Jack and the dog moved toward the girl. She disappeared. Jack and Simon went to the spot where the girl had been standing, but she was not to be found. Using the flashlight, Jack looked down the road and around the bushes, but found nothing. Later on, Janet and the children returned to the van. Was sitting around the fire, drinking soda and snacking, when they heard a young girl's voice coming from across the lake. The near shore of the lake was about 50 or 60 yards from where the swirls were situated, and across the lake was another 150 yards. In the quiet of the night, they heard the voice call out, Help me! Help me! Jack stayed with Kim and the twins. Davey, a strapping teenager, who was a wrestler and football player, went with Janet and Don to the other side of the lake to determine if someone was in trouble. They took the flashlight with them, walked around the lake, and called out, but they didn't hear the voice again. Since no one had returned their call, they thought it might have been a prank. On their way back to the van, they were walking past the small grocery store by the recreation hall when they were stopped dead in their tracks by what was taking place. Although there was no breeze, a heavy 50-gallon metal trash can started to spin around furiously just a few feet from them. The floodlight from the store was on, and they could clearly see that the can was spinning very quickly. Jack, who was waiting for them to return, looked out and also saw the can spinning. Janet, Don, and Davy looked at each other as the can continued to spin on its own for 20 or 30 seconds. The spinning then stopped abruptly, and the can fell over. There was no animal inside, and still, no wind. After hearing the girl's voice, and now this, Janet, Don, and Davy were unnerved. Let's get out of here, Don screamed, and the three of them rushed over to where Jack was waiting by the van. They grouped around the fire, all of them frightened. Jack decided to tell them what had happened with the clothesline, and about the girl he had seen. The Smurls searched their minds for logical explanations, but couldn't come up with any. They left the campground the next day to drive home to West Pittston. Jack and Janet wondered if they were imagining all this. The apparition of the young girl and the violently spinning garbage can proved one thing to Janet and Jack Smurl, that the Warrens were right. Ed and Lorraine had told them that the demon could travel with them. The demon reinforced this on their way home. Halfway there, a terrible and unexplainable vibration began moving through the van, almost like huge sound waves that could crumble solid edifices in their wake. Jack had to pull over to the roadside before the vibration stopped. The impressive steam up, the yellow lights spilling from the windows seemed particularly inviting. Donald Bennett, still as excited as he had been a week earlier, pulled into the driveway behind several other cars and then went inside. Two hours later, he found himself one of seven people still spellbound by a presentation of charts, photographs, artifacts, and tape recordings, each of which revealed a special aspect of the spirit world. Seated around him were a policeman, a dentist, a service station manager, a college student, a nun, and a certified public accountant. First Ed, and then Lorraine had talked, and then a man who revealed his first experience as an apprentice demonologist. Donald attributed the man's nervousness to simple anxiety over having to stand up in front of a group. But he soon realized that what the man was nervous about was his experience in accompanying Ed and Lorraine. The man, tall, thin, wearing a blue turtleneck sweater and a tweed sport coat with sleeves not quite long enough to cover his wrist, stabbed at the button of a tape recorder and said, I went into a room by myself with a tape recorder, and this is what I brought back. At first, all Donald could hear was ambient sound okay. in the room, the machine itself running. But then a rapping started, slowly and faintly at first, then increasingly sharp and more frequent. Then the rapping was joined by an eerie panting sound, as if a huge animal had run out of breath. Then the rapping became gigantic thuds. Donald watched the man's face pale as the tape rolled on. He also noticed that the man's left eye had developed a tape. When the man was finished, Ed began giving an impromptu lecture about some of his experiences in demonology. Seeing a crucifix literally explode when a demonic spirit focused on it. Examining a human skull used for drinking blood during satanic ceremonies. Studying a rag doll used by a demonic spirit that began to exert control over a very young girl. 
watching bottles of bleach and detergent being levitated behind him as he ascended basement steps. Validating the authenticity of a psychic photograph taken in Mendon, Massachusetts that clearly shows the presence of a ghost. Ed related many other incidents, then recommended that serious students of The Stigmatist by Reverend Charles M. Carty, True and False Possession by Jean Leonit, and Poltergeist Over England by Harry Price. At the end of the night's meeting, Donald saw the man who had spoken go up to Ed, say something softly, and then put out his hand. Hmm. Ed shook it, and either was smiling. The man then went over to the hall closet, got his coat, Joker. and left. Donald sensed what had gone on, but left it for Ed to confirm. Addressing the remaining six students, Ed said, Dean has decided to drop out. I don't think I have to tell you that his encounter at the house we took him to shook him very deeply. He said that he's slept very little since that night, and that he's lost his appetite, and that his wife is against him going on in demonology. I think right now he needs our prayers. So why don't we take a few minutes right now and say a short rosary for him. Donald, though not a Catholic, willingly joined in the prayers. He had had his first glimpse of a man whose existence had been threatened by the supernatural. It was a glimpse he would never forget. The assault continues. Janet, would you describe some of the events that took place after you returned from camping out? Well, the night we got home, Shannon was levitated, and it took us several hours to calm her down. And then Mary. What about Mary? To be honest, all of us had this fear in the back of our minds that the demon would do something that would cause her to have a heart attack. Something like that happened. The black form came into Mary's bedroom, and it frightened her so much that... But what? That we were afraid... What else happened? The Shannon was thrown out of bed, very violently. We heard the noise in the middle of the night and ran down the hall and found her on the floor, badly bruised and sobbing. Did she remember what happened? She said that the dark form had appeared and thrown her out of bed. Threw her so hard that she burst in the wall and on the floor. Then he spoke to her. What did he say? One strike, two strikes, three strikes and you're out. That was when Jack sort of went crazy. All right. He saw Shannon there on the floor, right, and he just couldn't take go. it anymore. He started shouting at the demon to show itself. He held a container of holy water in his hand and kept calling for the demon to come out. I was very proud of him. He wasn't afraid of the demon at all. He just wanted to have it out once and for all, even if it cost him his life. Then John and Mary came over. Somewhere. They'd heard the noise. Yes. Shannon's being thrown out of bed had awakened everybody on our side. Then John and Mary heard that we were up, so they came over to see if anything was wrong. John did something fantastic that night. What was that? He brought over this certified relic he has, a wooden cross that contains a thread of the robe of Jesus Christ. He said, I think the demon means to kill all of us. I didn't used to think that. I thought it just wanted to torment us, but now I think it wants our lives. So I want you and Jack to have this relic to protect yourselves with. But if you don't have it, you won't have anything to protect yourself with, we said. Then Mary spoke up and said, and I'll never forget this. We're old. If something happens to us, we've lived our lives. You have a family to raise. You take the relic. You can see the tears in Jack's eyes. He was really moved by this. Did things calm down? Not really. For Jack, they even got worse at work. The demon wasn't satisfied with destroying our home lives, and even our lives at the campground where we'd been going for years. Now it even wanted to destroy Jack's job. Testimony of Maria Ramos. I have worked with Jack for many years at the company. I know him to be a reasonable, level-headed man not given to flights of fancy or wild imaginings. I have to say, though, that when he first started telling me about some of the things going on around his house, I had some doubts. I thought there might be a natural explanation for these events. 
Then the phone in our office started its really strange ringing. One day, after Jack had explained to me how terrified he'd been the night before by being levitated, I was sitting at my desk when the phone started making this very strange noise, almost like a fire alarm going off. A very long, urgent burn. You almost had to cover your ears. Over the next few months, this happened dozens of times. The phone company sent several repairmen, but none of them could explain the eerie and irritating sounds coming from the phone. Then one day the phone was accompanied by a very filthy odor. As if our office was a dank cellar, that kind of smell. We tried opening windows and spraying the area where we worked, but that didn't help. The smell was what convinced me that there really were supernatural forces working on Jack. The smell and the radio. One day Jack, who looked more and more drained and exhausted from what was going on at home, asked me to listen to the radio on his desk. Am I losing my mind, Maria? Or can you hear tappings inside the radio? I listened carefully. At first, I didn't hear anything. But then I began to hear taps. One, two, three taps, like somebody was knocking on the radio with his knuckles. The intermittent tapping went on for several minutes, and then it stopped. I'm sorry for you, Jack. I really am. At church, I asked the people in the congregation to start praying for the Smurls. I shared with the others the experiences I'd had with Jack and spoke of the supernatural forces that were working on him and his family. None of us could imagine what such a strain would put on your health and sanity. Just from my brush with it, I'll never forget the sound the phone made or the stench in the office. I have to wonder how long I'd hold up under such an attack. I don't know how the Smurls held on as long as they did. Eerie intrusion. Rain threatened in the dark gray afternoon. It was one of those days when the temperature was inexplicably more like October than July. The girls were off playing, though the serious way that Don and Kim went at softball, Janet wondered if playing was the right word, and Jack was at work. Janet had made a cabbage salad for dinner and put it in the refrigerator so it would be cold at dinner time. The TV was on, a soap opera playing out its grim view of the human condition, when Janet began feeling a sudden headache and decided to lie down on the couch. As she stretched out, she did not have to wonder why she had been having so many headaches lately. Ever since the camping experience, she and Jack had lived with the knowledge that even if they did sell the duplex and move, the demon might well... follow them to the camp, it could obviously follow them anywhere. She had been asleep approximately 20 minutes when she felt a very gentle touch, like fingers meant to arouse her sexually, begin to move up her thighs and then over her stomach and onto the rest of her body. Abruptly, she came fully awake. Her first reaction was sarcasm. Here we go again. As ominous as the demon could be, it also reminded Janet sometimes of a small, irritating child bent on bothering its parent. Janet waited a moment, then put her head back on the arm of the couch, intending to return to sleep. The headache was still pounding away. She had not quite reached the point of sleep when she felt the touch return. She started up on the couch because this time, the demon's touch was even more suggestive and more threatening. The demon's invisible hands found her throat and began choking her. Janet could feel blood filling her face as she clawed out at her unseen assailant. Help! She did her best to be heard, but she knew there were two things against her. The demon's clutches were so tight she could barely get out a sound. And the house was empty. She couldn't yell loudly enough for Mary to hear. She was thrown off the couch, the demon keeping the pressure on her. Janet saw the blackness of death come rushing at her and realized that her mind was beginning to give in to the blackness, Victory. the way drowning victims are said to surrender finally to their own overwhelming darkness. Then she recalled what Ed Warren told her about imagining herself in the protective light of Christ's love. As she started to picture Christ in her mind, Simon came in from the sword. kitchen where he'd been asleep and seemed to sense what was going on in the room. The German Shepherd crouched low, bearing teeth dripping with saliva, ready to attack Janet's torturer. Simon leapt through the air, snapping his jaws and reaching out with powerful paws, raking at the empty air. 
He landed next to the couch, still growling but frustrated now, because he could not save the mistress she loved. As for Janet, the picture of Christ she had conjured up became more and more vivid. She saw the Savior with his hands reaching out to her. He wore a flowing white robe and was bathed in a beautiful pearl-colored glow. In her mind, Janet reached out and accepted Christ's offer of help. As she moved toward him, she felt herself move within the protection of his beautiful spiritual light. Suddenly, she had a mental image of herself glowing in the same light in which Christ stood. All the time this imaging process was going on, the demon's hands continued to strangle her, and she writhed and fought under the massive strength working on her throat. Okay. But the deeper she was drawn into the light surrounding Christ, the less effect the hands had on her breathing. Simon continued to growl, trying to understand how he could help. Let's open it. Jesus, please protect me! The hands had loosened to the point that she could hear herself shout out now. Once again, she cried, Jesus, please protect me! By now, the mental impression she had of being one with Jesus was nearly complete. And so the demon's hands loosened even more until she could struggle to an upright position and grab a container of holy water nearby. She sprinkled drops of the pure water through the air. And at last, felt her throat clean once more. She had expected her first reaction to freedom, if in fact she did not die, to be one of relief. But instead, she sat on the edge of the couch, sobbing, almost without control. She had never been so close to death before, and the sense of it had been terrifying. Only Christ and his light of love had saved her. That night, when she told Jack about the strangulation, he took her in his arms and held her for a very long time. Then he gathered the four children around them, and together, they thanked God for sparing Janet's life. I don't know what to do next, Janet said. Okay. I do, Jack said. So easy, he went to the phone and called Ed Warren. Speculation. As he always did for exorcisms, Father McKenna fasted for his trip to the Smurls in West Pittston, where he hoped to put an end once and for all to the curse that lay over the duplex like the most terrible, lingering illness. On the day of the second exorcism, the weather offered the cleric some pleasant views of rolling, verdant hills, and cloudless blue sky. He arrived near noon to find the Smurls and their children, and Mary and John as well, standing in the living room waiting for him. Before he began the rite of exorcism, he talked a while with Jan and Jack, asking them to tell him about some of the things that had taken place since the first exorcism. Watching them, listening to them, Father McKenna could assess just how strong the demon had become. He saw before him two people ravaged by a force they did not understand. Because he did not say mass this time, the ceremony was briefer. Father McKenna walked through every room on both sides of the duplex, dispensing holy water and ancient prayers in Latin. Then he blessed each member of the family individually. He even said a special animal blessing for Simon, all these prayers coming from the Rituale Romana, a document of scarcely more than 25 pages that contains all the ancient prayers and incantations for dealing with demons. Dominus Obiscum, he said in the Mass Latin of the traditional church. When the priest had concluded his duties, Janet said, There's one big difference between this time and last time. What's that? Father McKenna asked. The demon hasn't done anything. And so it hadn't. During the first exorcism, the demon had rattled cupboards, taken the form of an angry youngster, and set foul odors on the air. Is that a good sign? Janet asked. Father McKenna said, Let's hope so. Janet and Jack once again asked the priest to stay for dinner, but he said that he wished to continue his fast, and anyway, had several things to do back at the parish. His eyes scanned the living room. He was long accustomed to the subtlest presence of demons, and he watched for such a sign now. Nothing. His ears were equally accustomed to the sounds of demons. He listened and heard nothing. Father McKenna bowed his head and said a silent prayer that the Smurls would now be left alone once and for all. The Smurls bid the priest goodbye and walked him out to his car. Several neighbors, knowing the rite was going to take place that afternoon, stood on their porches and watched solemnly as the priest got in his car and drove away. 
Janet and Jack could not contain their optimism. They went inside the house, sniffed the air, looked around. Once again, it felt as if the house was theirs and did not belong to the demon. For the duration of daylight and well into the night, their optimism would prove well-founded. On the drive back to Connecticut, enjoying the deep green spectacle of summer along Interstate 84, Father McKenna found himself thinking about an exorcism he'd participated in some years earlier, and wondered why he hadn't thought of this before. In the Brenner case, excavation workers who'd been digging up a drainage ditch had found bones wrapped in decaying cloth buried deep in the ground. Father McKenna had a forensic expert examine the bones. The forensics man determined that they were pig bones, at least 800 years old. Immediately, Father McKenna knew why the Brenner's house was haunted. Part of its yard was the site where a pagan ritual had taken place more than eight centuries earlier. No wonder demons infested the house. As he drove, Father McKenna had the sinking feeling that the exorcism he'd just performed had not worked. Many times following such a rite, he felt elation, but now he was filled with brooding. <laughs> he could recall few infestations that had presented the problems the Smurls were encountering, and the priest felt that he had failed to help them. That night, Father McKenna phoned to the Smurls to see how things were going. He was half surprised to hear Janet say, really? You're going just great, Father. And we want to thank you again. No problems, then? None at all. We went out and got a pizza to celebrate, in fact. Well, I'll be praying for you, Janet. Thanks so much, Father. That night, as he said his nightly prayers, a tremor of fear passed through the priest. He had a terrible sense that not all was well at the Smurl household. Once again, a sense of failure flooded through him. He felt almost as if he had somehow betrayed this fine family. He closed his eyes and continued to pray. The Apprentice Demonologist. You wear clothes you don't mind getting dirty. Because even though the movies like to make believe that our job has a lot of focus focus stuff to it, what we really do is look in crevices, in cracks, in closets, in cellars, in attics, in down chimneys, in down wells, and down sewers. Anywhere dogs that can be hide. Because that's the kind of place the demons and spirits favor. And instead of crystal balls and fancy robes and magic wands, we carry tape recorders and flashlights and pen lights. Screwdrivers and putty knives and hammers and even tweezers in some cases. And on top of that, we take along video equipment and cameras that can shoot in the dark if necessary and logs in which to note the exact time. And we take along assistants who give us courage and who let us give them courage because they know we're all part of the team. Donald Bennett was in his third month as a student of demonology and Ed Warren was helping him prepare for the day that was coming soon. The day Donald Bennett would quit looking at slides and listening to tapes and would, for himself, enter a house infested with demons. After talking about the instruments and tools demonologists use, Ed looked at Donald and said, Now, I want to tell you about some people I know. Some people we're going to be visiting soon. Donald Bennett. Just by his tone of voice, I knew that Ed had finally decided to take me along. I'd expected my first feeling to be one of real joy, but instead, I have to admit, I felt my stomach nod up, and I felt my heartbeat increase. There was no doubt about it. As much as I wanted to be a demonologist, going into an infested house still scared me. At that point, Ed proceeded to tell Donald all about this couple named Janet and Jack Smurrow. Hey, look at this. The Terrible Truth. That night, Jack had some problems getting to sleep. Excitement caused him to feel almost supercharged with energy. The house was calm and quiet. His parents had reflected this welcome to by and walked him out to his car. Several neighbors, knowing the rite was going to take place that afternoon, stood on their porches and watched solemnly as the priest got in his car and drove away. Janet and Jack could not contain their optimism. They went inside the house, sniffed the air, looked around. Once again, it felt as if the house was theirs and did not belong to the demon. For the duration of daylight and well into the night, their optimism would prove well-founded. Hey. On the drive back to Connecticut, Indeed. enjoying the deep green spectacle of summer along Interstate 84, Father McKenna found himself thinking about an exorcism he participated in some years earlier, 
and wondering why he hasn't thought of this before. In the Brenner case, excavation workers who had been digging up a drainage ditch had found bones wrapped in decayed cloth buried deep in the ground. Father McKenna had a forensic expert examine the bones. The forensics man determined that they were pig bones, at least 800 years old. Immediately, Father McKenna knew why the Brenner's house was haunted. Part of its yard was the site where a pagan ritual had taken place more than eight centuries earlier. No wonder demons infested the house. As he drove, Father McKenna had the sinking feeling that the exorcism he'd just performed had not worked. Many times following such a rite, he felt elation, but now he was filled with brooding. He could recall few infestations that had presented the problems the Smurls were encountering, and the priest felt that he had failed to help them. That night, Father McKenna phoned the Smurls to see how things were going. He was half surprised to hear Janet say, They're going just great, Father, and we want to thank you again. No problems, then? None at all. We went out and got a pizza to celebrate, in fact. Well, I'll be praying for you, Janet. Thanks so much, Father. That night, as he said his nightly prayers, a tremor of fear passed through the priest. He had a terrible sense that not all was well at the Smurl household. Once again, a sense of failure flooded through him. He felt almost as if he had somehow betrayed his fine family. He closed his eyes and continued to pray. The Apprentice Demonologist You wear clothes you don't mind getting dirty. Because even though the movies like to make believe that our job has a lot of hocus pocus stuff to it, what we really do is look in crevices, in cracks, in closets, in cellars, in attics, and down chimneys, and down wells, and down sewers. Anywhere dark that things can hide. Because that's the kind of place that demons and spirits favor. And instead of crystal balls, and fancy robes, and magic wands, we carry tape recorders, and flashlights, and pen lights, and screwdrivers, and putty knives, and hammers, and even tweezers in some cases. And on top of that, we take along video equipment and cameras that can shoot in the dark if necessary, and logs in which to note the exact time. And we take along assistants who give us courage, and who let us give them courage because they know we're all part of the team. Donald Bennett was in his third month as a student of demonology, and Ed Warren was helping him prepare for the day that was coming soon. The day Donald Bennett would quit looking at slides and listening to tapes and would, for himself, enter a house infested with demons. After talking about the instruments and tools demonologists use, Ed looked at Donald and said, Now, I want to tell you about some people I know. Some people we're going to be visiting soon. Donald Bennett. Just by his tone of voice, I knew that Ed had finally decided to take me along. I'd expected my first feeling to be one of real joy. But instead, I have to admit, I felt my stomach not up, and I felt my heartbeat increase. There was no doubt about it. As much as I wanted to be a demonologist, going into an infested house still scared me. At that point, Ed proceeded to tell Donald all about this couple is. named Janet and Jack Smurl. For the time being. The terrible truth. That night, Jack had some problems getting to sleep. Excitement caused him to feel almost supercharged with energy. The house was calm and quiet. His parents had reflected this welcome turn of events. He hadn't seen them smile so much in nearly two years. Jack lay in the shadows of the bedroom trying to ease himself into sleep. He thanked God for all his blessings, and within ten minutes, found the darkness that was asleep, and let it overwhelm him gently. Jack came up out of bed as if a shotgun blast had sounded in the hallway. He was bathed in sweat and shaking. Moments later, Janet sat up next to him. My God, she said. They both heard banging in the walls, a sure sign that it had not gone at all. After a time, as the banging continued, Janet and Jack went in to comfort their daughters. The girls were well aware of what the banging represented. Kim, through tears, said, Is it ever going to leave us alone, Mom? Ever? Speaking in barely a whisper and fighting back her own tears, Janet said, I don't know, honey. We found I really don't know. Time. After an hour or so, the banging stopped. The girls went back to sleep. Ready? Jack and Janet lay in bed, wrapped in each other's arms, watching Dawn smudge the window. They were exhausted, drained, and terrified. 
I don't know what we're going to do, Janet said. Somewhere there's somebody who can help us. There's just got to be. He went on to say something he thought he'd never say. Maybe it's time we went public. Us ...and call us. But the girls... Maybe there's some way we can do this anonymously. But how? Hey. Let's talk to Ed and Lorraine about it. Going public is almost as frightening as dealing with the demon, Janet said. He sighed, stared glumly at the streaked dawn sky. We've got to do something, Janet. Yeah. We've got to. But as he thought of all the problems hey. publicity would inflict on his family, Jack said, let's give it a little more time. Well, let's just see what happens, yeah. right? Janet said gently, All right, Jack, if that's what you think is best. She held him, and finally, they drifted into uneasy sleep. <laughs> Father McKenna's sleep was also troubled that night. He found himself spending many long hours saying ancient prayers for the Smurls, prayers the early Christians believed were the only real weapons against Satan. <laughs> Bright evil. Let's go. Janet and Jack had been asleep only a few minutes when the mattress started shaking. Jack, I've never been in an earthquake, but I've heard them described, and this was what our bed felt like. Then it started to rise from the bed, the whole mattress, and us with it. Both of us had been levitating before during the haunting, but not like this. Not with the bed being thrown around so violently. Then, just as usual, we were dropped back onto the frame. I did the only thing I could. As soon as the bed stopped shaking, I grabbed a jar of holy water and started to sprinkle the whole bed. We didn't sleep the rest of the night. On the Friday of that same week, the Smurl family sat down to the dinner table only to see the oak hutch in the kitchen open by itself. Eighteen cups and saucers came tumbling out and crashed to the floor. Bits and pieces of ruined china were scattered all over the floor and some of the sharp edges with scratch marks on the bottom of the hut. Janet buried her hands in her face and began to weep softly. She had waited 17 years for the hut, until they had the money they needed to afford it, and now it was scratched and marred. Suddenly, anger overtook her, and she raised her head and shouted, I hate this house! This is my other Jack and the children spent the next 20 minutes trying to comfort her. Over the next week, the bathroom, which seemed to hold a special appeal for the demon, became very active with examples of infestation, most of it directed toward Janet. Uh... On Monday night, as she stepped into the tub, she saw a large, bright human form standing in the corner. Indeed. It was approximately five feet tall and looked like a bright light with shoulders and a head, but no neck, legs, or arms. It had no features that Janet could see. Its golden glow hurt her eyes, as if she were gazing directly into the sun. Terrified, she called out for Jack, but by the time he reached the bathroom, the glowing creature was gone. Hmm. On Wednesday, as she sat in the tub, she heard a man moaning, Oh! 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 As if in sexual ecstasy. Janet screamed for Jack immediately. Oh. This time, Jack stayed with Janet, sitting beneath the crucifix that was over the doorway in the hall. While she finished her bath, he read from a missile. As he read the holy words about the Blessed Mother, Jack and Janet smelled the scent of roses in the air. Janet, I don't have any doubt that the forces from heaven were in the house at that moment to wage war against the demon and to protect our family from physical harm. Unquestionably, the most alarming incident took place that Thursday night and once more in the bathroom. Janet went to sleep early, but awakened around 2 a.m. Thirsty, she got up to get herself a drink of water. She was tired enough that she didn't give any thought to supernatural beings. She simply wanted a drink of water, and then wanted to go back to sleep. Because of all the incidents lately, Jack had insisted on making the bathroom light on all night. Now, as Janet turned into the bathroom, she saw something that woke her up completely. Standing in front of the towel cabinet was a large, hunched, hooded black form that had materialized many times since the house had first been invested. Janet watched, fascinated and repelled at the same time as the form's hands tried to open the cabinet doors. Seeming to hear her, the figure's head turned to the right and gazed sightlessly at Janet. Janet, I felt as if the thing was looking right through me. 
My skin literally crawled. I realized that I had only a nightgown on, and I was worried about it becoming an incubus, and raping me. Then it started to move away from the cabinet and toward me. I ran down the hall, stumbling on a throw rug and banging my knee pretty badly, but I kept running. I went in and started shaking Jack. I was afraid the demon might have put him in a psychic sleep. Fortunately, I was able to wake him up right away. He went with me to the bathroom, taking the holy water along. But by that time, the dark form had left. I didn't sleep the rest of the night. Her fears about the incubus were realized the next night, when Janet, relaxing next to Jack on the bed, felt an invisible hand move up her body. Jack, seeing that his wife was being attacked, grabbed the holy water from the nightstand. After pulling the covers off Janet, he said in a commanding voice, In the name of Jesus Christ, I order you to leave! Then Janet picked up the same prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, I order you to leave! The unseen hands continued to violate her, but as they sprayed holy water and uttered the words of the special prayer, Janet eventually felt the hands withdraw, her body her own again. Finally, she collapsed in Jack's strong and protective embrace. But the night was not over. After getting to sleep an hour later, the Smurls were awakened by the mattress being shaken violently, much as it had earlier. Invisible punches came back, though tonight they lasted only briefly. This is my but the other demon side. was not done. It picked up the whole mattress and levitated it about a foot in the air, tilting it up and down like a roller coaster. By the time the demon was finished with them this time, their daughters stood in the doorway, crying and praying. Janet cried out, This is our house, damn it! Leave us alone! Around three that same morning, Janet was visited by an apparition of an elderly woman with a fuzzy face. Her hair was pulled back into a bun. She wore wire rimmed glasses with round lenses. Beneath a navy blue cardigan sweater, she wore a faded hunch dress. She sat at a phantom of a white colonial style table. The woman said nothing to Janet, and they smiled at her in her pleasant way. Janet, I had the distinct impression this woman wanted to tell me something, but I wasn't sure why. We just watched each other. The odd thing was, I wasn't afraid. If this was the demon taking a new form, it had taken a form that didn't frighten me. Then she was gone. Table and all, just like that. In her place were these lights. Blue, gold, and white, flashing all over. It was like strobe lights from the 60s. Jack didn't wake up during any of this. I got to sleep just before dawn and then the phone rang. It woke Jack up. He got it, but there was nobody on the other end. I told him what had happened to the elderly woman. Neither of us could understand it. Usually the spirits were ugly or scary. This one had been... Are you sure? I guess. Next morning, Janet was in the kitchen doing dishes when she heard a noise on the front porch. Walking into the living room, Janet saw a woman who was a golden glowing form, even more blinded than the creature the other night. The woman's hair, skin, and clothes were composed of this stunning white gold color. Janet couldn't discern any physical features at all. As Janet cautiously approached the door, the woman, predictably, vanished. That afternoon, during some cleaning, Janet looked up and saw the same white gold woman standing in front of her. Turning off the vacuum cleaner, Janet started toward the woman, but the woman disappeared once more. Later in the afternoon, the woman appeared once more. This time, the golden glow seemed to have a fiery essence, and Janet sensed for the first time that the woman was here not merely to alarm her, but to hurt her. In bed that night, Janet turned to Jack to say something to him, and she saw for the first time her husband look at her as if she were the demon. Jack. I hadn't been expecting it. We were just having a normal conversation, I mean. And Janet turned it to me, and then steam started coming from her mouth. It really scared me. I started moving no, away from her, see. and then I realized and like that this was exactly what the demon would want me to do. It had forced steam out of Janet's mouth to force us apart. I thought of what Ed and Lorraine had told us about the demon always trying to destroy families. Well, that's exactly what it was doing. So I very calmly answer. told Janet what was happening about the steam coming out of her mouth. And then she started watching herself and seeing the steam too. In a way, it was sort of funny. We even laughed about it a little. But when I first saw it, it really spooked me. No doubt about that. In the middle of the night, Jack reached over and touched Janet softly and said, 
be awake? Yes. Hmm. It's time, isn't it? To talk to Ed and Lorraine. About going public? Yeah. Janet thought a moment. I guess at this point I don't know what else we can do. Maybe somebody out there will know something about cases like this. As they There's talked, they heard a cry come from Show one of the girls' bedrooms. Door. They ran down the hall and into the twins' room. Karen was sitting out in tears, rolling down her cheeks. I saw him again, Mommy. I saw him again. Oh, honey. The man in the long black thing? I don't the see black weakness. cloak? Yes. Jack and Janet glanced at each other nervously. What was he doing? He was in the hall. I was afraid he was coming down to your room to get you. She started crying again. Jack, infuriated, slammed his fist into his hand and went back to bed while Janet stayed and comforted Karen. The demon was beginning to achieve its goal. It was trying to destroy the Smurl family one by one. There was just one thing it hadn't counted on, and that was Jack Smurl himself. Nobody was going to destroy Jack's family. Nobody. Ed Warren. Father McKenna's sense that the demon has not been overcome by the second exorcism proved to be true. Lorraine, Chris, and I, and at various times other members of the team, stayed in contact with Janet and Jack, offering them advice and any solace we could, which, I have to admit, wasn't much at this point. The demon seeming to be virtually, if not literally, out of control. One subject that came up many times was the rather ominous one of Amityville, which was a perfect example of what could happen when a demon reached the fourth stage of infestation, that being possession. At Amityville, of course, 24-year-old Ronald DeFeo had taken a rifle and systematically murdered his parents, two brothers and two sisters. Today, he is in prison, sentenced for life. Until the murder, Ronald DeFeo had been a normal young man, filled with the desires of most young men. But some sinister force in the Amityville house had taken control of him, and the sad and bloody results have since been well documented. Lorraine and I spent many long days and nights after being called into the Amityville case, trying to determine if Ronald had merely gone insane, or if he'd become demon-infested himself. All the evidence, and it was considerable, pointed to the latter and we're still learning things about the Amityville situation that only strengthen our belief that it was a clear and classic case of possession. Now we begin to worry along the same lines about the tomorrow. What if the demon took control of someone in the house and turned an otherwise innocent mind to dark and violent thoughts, much as Ronald the Fado's mind had been turned to dark and violent thoughts? Father McKenna had done all he could, and so would we, and yet the demon and his dependent spirits still prowled both sides of the duplex in West Houston, its ultimate goal becoming more and more obvious. It wanted to destroy the Smurl family by whatever means necessary. One option we considered was getting a group of priests involved in the situation, and seeing if, in a collective way, we could derive some plan or insight that would drive the demon from the household. To be blunt, and I say this as a most devout Catholic, we had no luck whatsoever in interesting the church in helping us. Diocese officials are often skeptical of the supernatural because they fear being drawn into a hoax or something that will later be explained away by perfectly logical means. About this time, Janet and Jack were getting desperate. They phoned once to say that they were strongly considering selling the house, and they phoned another time to say that they were now about to simply abandon their home. We told them the terrible truth. We explained that the demon could well follow them, just as it had to the campground on at least two other occasions. And we also told them that they might buy a new house, only to find that the demon lurked in the attic or basement or even kitchen. We convinced them there was nothing to gain in moving. Janet seemed particularly, and understandably, depressed by this conversation because Jack's sister, Cindy Coleman, had arrived at the Smurl house with her husband and teenage son, Davy. Cindy had had a horrible supernatural experience in Janet's house. While using the bathroom, the light on, she had become entirely surrounded by darkness, as if at the bottom of some deep abyss. She remained in the abyss so long, she wondered if she wouldn't lose her mind. 
Finally, the darkness lifted, and she saw the bathroom again. The demon once more demonstrated its power, just as it had a few days earlier when Scott Bloom, a nephew, had seen a black figure standing on Jack's and Janet's front porch. Janet said, We've been talking, Ed. We think it's time we went public. Maybe when the diocese hears our story, they'll be forced into helping us. It was a sort of decision neither Lorraine nor I could make for them. It was a sort of decision, a very serious one, that might well have a great lasting impact on their lives and the lives of their children, that we had to let them reach on their own. You sure? I asked. Nice. Yes, Janet said. You realize if word gets out, you could be laughing stocks. I've got a good idea. She finished the sentence for me. Nothing could be worse than what we've been going through the past few weeks, Ed. Go ahead. <laughs> See if you can figure out the best way to make our story public. By public, Janet meant the public at large. Yeah. By now, many people in West Pittston knew about the Smurls and their tragic dilemma, and in general, most had reacted sympathetically. But, it has been our experience that when the public is confronted with something it both fears and misunderstands, think back to what Martin Luther King had to endure, or what AIDS patients must go through today, it can be a fickle and vicious judge of others. I said again, You're sure this is what you want, Janet? There was a pause, but only a slight one. And Janet's smile said, Yes. Yes, I'm sure. In Philadelphia, there's a television talk show called People Are Talking, hosted by an intelligent and open-minded man named Richard Bay. He had already invited Lorraine on, so... We called him and asked if we could bring the Smurls along. We promised him that his viewers would be intrigued and shocked by what they had to say. They agreed and so we set down certain conditions. Both Lorraine and I still had reservations about the Smurls revealing their identities, so we got Richard Bay's promise that they would be presented behind the screen so that they could not be recognized by viewers. And so that no one would know their last names, we would refer to them only as Janet and Jack. They agreed to all our conditions, and plans were set for our TV appearance. The Apprentice Demonologist. The basement door was closed. Donald Bennett listened as, near the front of Jack and Janet's Smurls duplex, Ed and Lorraine Warren moved around with two other members of the psychic team. Now, as Donald smelled spices from a rack over the stove, nutmeg was especially pleasant, his eyes moved to the doorknob, and he wondered if he should have volunteered for this assignment after all. While both Ed and Lorraine had been in the basement earlier today, and while Lorraine had received many clear psychic impressions of the place and found it safe, Donald felt anxious about going back down there alone. He smiled weakly at his fear. This was a lot different from lying on your bed in your parents' home and eating Fritos and reading a book about the occult. Over the five months he'd been preparing for this day, Donald had seen several people drop out of the program. He'd even seen a strapping big military man reduced to tears after spending long hours in a house heavily infested with malevolent spirits. As Donald stood there, he heard the floor creak. In the twilight, the kitchen was gauzy with darkness, and the sound of the aged boards made him start. He spun around, his mind racing with all sorts of dark and frightening images, to find Ed Warren standing there. How you doing, Donald? Oh, fine, Donald said, swallowing heavily. Ed grinned. Were you kind of afraid about going down there? I volunteered, Donald said. Ed continued grinning. He put his hand on Donald's shoulder. Doesn't mean a fella can't be scared just because he volunteers, I mean. Now Donald grinned. I always thought I'd be brave. Believe me, you are brave. Otherwise you wouldn't be in this house at all. Donald's gaze fell back on the worn metal doorknob. Ed said, I'd be glad to go with you. Donald silently thanked the older man but then stopped himself. He'd been waiting for this moment for so long, and now he was going to spoil it for himself. Or was he? I think it'd be better if I went down there myself. You okay with Donald it? said. So you sure? Skills you'd like Donald to nodded. Okay, Ed said. 
Lorraine and I are going it's upstairs. He started to turn, then paused. You positive? Positive. Ed's easy grin appeared once more. Gotta admit, I'm glad you're doing it alone. Donald laughed. Why don't you come downstairs in about half an hour and tell me that? Hell, Ed said. I'll even bring you a cup of hot chocolate. I'd appreciate that, Donald said. Then all that was left was to go down the basement steps just as he'd been planning all along. Alone. He set up a tape recorder and set the tape to rolling, and then he took out his log book and started making notes on what he saw. He accounted for his time in five-minute increments. Twice he heard noises he couldn't explain, and he jerked up from the straight-backed chair in which he sat. But when he shone his light around, he found nothing unusual or untoward. Then, as best he could, he sat back down and tried to relax. The basement smelled of sudsy laundry water and sweet fabric softener. In one of the small oblong windows, you could see dirt along the bottom of the glass, and in another, you could catch a fragment of the night sky and golden clouds racing across the quarter moon. After a time, he took out his flashlight and began a thorough examination of the basement, every corner, every crevice, every possible place a spirit could use as an entry point or hiding place. He cataloged each of these carefully. He was on his hands and knees when he heard something that sounded like a piece of chalk scraping across the blackboard. He jumped up so quickly that he banged his head against the side of the washer, hard enough that he nearly knocked himself out. While holding his left hand against the lump quickly forming on his forehead, he squinted out of one eye to see what had caused the noise. And that's when he saw that the sound was coming from the dryer, some malfunction of the motor. And that's how Ed Warren, coming down the stairs with the promised cup of hot chocolate, found him, sitting on the floor, holding his head from a self-inflicted wound. What happened to you? You don't want to know, Donald said. Ed looked worried. Donald felt obliged to tell him. I got injured, and it wasn't even a spirit, Donald said, concluding his story. Ed helped him up and gave him his hot chocolate. Then Ed pointed at the watch on his own thick wrist. Yeah, but you know what? What? Donald said, still smarting from the pain. You did what you said you wanted to do. You wanted to stay down here half an hour by yourself. And that's just what you did. But even though Ed's voice really swelled with pride for Donald's accomplishment, he sensed that the young man was deeply disturbed. I learned something while I was down here, Donald said. Though he knew what Donald was about to say, Ed kept his face free of any expression. They simply let the young man talk. I... I'm not cut out to be a demonologist, Ed. It's just too... Frightening is the only word I can think of. Down here, I sensed things I'd just as soon forget. I... Ed put a steadying hand on Donald's shoulder. You don't need to justify yourself to me, Donald. You're not the first person to make that decision. And obviously, you won't be the last. I just feel so damn ashamed, I guess. Ed laughed. Ashamed of what? I'm not one of the spend your life searching in dark nooks and crannies for demons? You think that's something to be ashamed of? He nodded to the stairs. You feel like going out for a pizza? You kidding? Ed smiled. I've never been known to kid about pizza. Today, Donald Bennett is employed by a large multinational corporation. Is married and still has nightmares about his half hour in the basement. It's not something your mind ever lets go of. I know it sounds corny, but I was in the presence of true evil. And it really shook me, just paralyzed me in a way. I knew then why so few people stay in the field of demonology. It just takes too much out of you. Oh my, not quite what I was expecting. An eerie trip. Kim, Shannon, and Karen stayed at home with John and Mary Smurl. Don visited the Coleman's in New Jersey, and early on a Tuesday evening, Janet and Jack got into their van and set off for Philadelphia along the beautiful Pennsylvania Turnpike. The month was July, and the rolling hills were furious green. Jack. It started out being very relaxing. We were very nervous about what we were going to do, tell our story on TV and all, but... We found the trip itself real pleasant. 
The scenery was great, and it was a chance for us to be alone and just talk about normal things. Then something started kicking me in the back. Jack felt the pressure of a boot grinding into his backbone. The kick was so hard that he was knocked forward into the steering wheel. To keep the car from going off the road, he had to slow down and grip the wheel tightly. Jenna could see that Jack was suddenly drenched in sweat, and that his face had become pale. Something's kicking me! Without a word, Janet reached for the holy water she carried in an aspirin bottle. She quickly sprinkled the back seat of the van, then spoke the words of the prayer of the Warrens and taught them. Almost immediately, the kicking stopped. I guess it doesn't want us to tell our story, Janet said. Jack surprised her by smiling. Good. Then I'm glad we're doing it. But the incident in the van would not be their only demonic experience that day. Once they reached Philadelphia, Janet and Jack checked into a Holiday Inn. They had a good dinner in a nearby restaurant, then went back to their room. They had been lying down for 20 minutes, when the mattress began shaking violently. By now, they were well familiar with this particular form of haunting. Holy water, dispensed in great dollops by Janet, brought the shaking to a stop. At least for the time being. Around midnight, the presence began pounding on the mattress with such forceful blows that Janet and Jack had no choice but to sit in chairs and smoke cigarettes, just watching the demon go berserk. From down the hall, Janet could hear the laughter of two couples who were returning to their room, slightly drunk and having a good time. How simple my life used to be, she thought. She watched the obscene force continue to pummel the mattress. We'll be so tired we won't make any sense on TV, Janet said. Somberly, Jack replied, I think that's exactly what it's got in mind, honey. In the morning, the Smurls were exhausted and depressed. Not even in a motel far from home could they get a good night's sleep. Ed Warren. Lorraine had been fighting a head cold all week, so when we met the Smurls for breakfast, about all she felt like eating was a poached egg and a piece of toast. The dining room was the sort you see in most modern motels, well appointed if you like furniture that is pressed wood rather than real wood, and rather grand in design. Lorraine had once joked that she thought motels hired madams to do their interior decoration. I had to agree with her. The Smurls looked bad. Nervous and weary, and after they described their night, I certainly understood why. They sat across from us in the dining room playing with the breakfast rather than eating it, and sounding as if they were having second thoughts about going on the show. Peripherally, I saw what happened to Lorraine, but at first I didn't understand the significance of what was going on. Janet, startled, said, It's in here. And so it was. Our chairs sat with their backs to a blank wall. Yet, it was some unseen entity lifting Lorraine's chair half an inch from the floor and smashing it into the table. I groped in my pocket for holy water and immediately began uttering the prayer that was never far from my lips. No Lorraine, long accustomed to the manifestations of the beast, looked anxious, taking my hand as I continued to pray. What is the matter? The entity left us then. Shall we you could feel it withdraw, the air less disturbed, its presence shrinking and then disappearing. Lorraine smiled bravely. I'd say there's somebody who's made very angry. The Smurls tried to smile too, but they managed only the barest of responses. Their demeanor did not bode well for our appearance on Richard Bay's TV show. Working in most modern TV studios is a bit like working aboard a submarine. Massive doors seal you into an environment that is dark except for small areas illuminated by great blasts of light. People move like phantoms in these deep shadows, carrying clipboards and wearing headphones. Being in the studio only made Janet and Jack more frightened. The set resembled that of most modern talk shows. We were put in the center of the stage area, while host Richard Bay sat on the edge of the lighted circle. Janet and Jack faced the audience directly, though they were concealed behind a gauzy screen. Before the show began, they talked to the Smurls, obviously trying to reassure them that given the lighting setup, nobody at home would be able to see their faces. For the first time in hours, Janet laughed. Isn't this how they interview Mafia people? In the shadows, you mean? I asked. She nodded. I grinned okay. back. Now that you mention it, it is. Richard Bay is known as a tough interviewer. 
Not excessive, never malicious or petty, but his questions are hardball as opposed to softball. Well dressed, yes. hands, confident, yeah. they managed to seem genuinely interested in the plight of the Smurls while remaining skeptical about some of their experiences. He asked the questions his viewing audience would. How did the Smurls know that their experiences couldn't be explained by natural causes? Were they a troubled family and therefore given to the kind of quiet hysteria you find in broken or damaged homes? Had they ever sought professional help, i.e. psychiatric help, to help mm -hmm. them deal with the phenomena that were plaguing them? These were the sort of questions people like the Smurls always got mm -hmm. at the beginning of an interview. But after about 10 minutes, something very curious started to happen. Before, Bay and the audience alike had been given to occasional uncomfortable titters and laughs. But as Janet and Jack began to talk at length about everything from the mysterious black form that moved from one side of the house to the other, about Jack's rape, about Shannon being hurled down the stairwell, Gradually, you could see a change in both me and the audience. Where before they'd been skeptical, now they were wrapped in serious. Lorraine and I corroborated what the Smurls were saying. To the inevitable question of why the Smurls okay, didn't simply move, I interjected an experience of my own. I explained that once when I was in England, I had tape recorded a demon. The whole voice on the tape telling me exactly what my wife, who was 3,000 miles away in Connecticut, was doing. I assured the audience, preternatural entities, which are negative ones, transcend distance and time, and can follow people wherever those people go. To confirm this, I pointed out that the demon had followed the Smalls to Philadelphia, and had ruined their night in the motel room. Then Janet and Jack talked about the two exorcisms. The audience seemed especially fascinated by this so, subject. So. They asked if the rites had been anything like the movie so, The Exorcist. Janet and Jack explained how the movie had been exaggerated for dramatic effect. While they were talking, Father McKenna phoned in and addressed the studio audience. He talked about why some of his exorcisms worked and some didn't. Though he could not prove this contention, he said, it was his belief that the religious rites may have been unsuccessful because of some occult items buried in the ground beneath the Smurls' home. During the entire interview, Janet expressed bitterness only once, and that's when the subject of the Catholic Church came up. She said that the family had received virtually no help from the church. Lorraine agreed, saying it was sad the way some churches treat families that are haunted. And she urged that church officials spend more time helping families instead of being doubtful. Richard Bay asked me, are demons afraid of anything? <sighs> Only one thing, really, Richard. The power of God. Can you summon up that power? Through well. prayer, you can. Bay, smiling, said that after all these years of being psychic investigators, we probably weren't Satan's favorite people. I said, he knows who we are. In many hauntings, we've heard our names called out. Does that frighten you? The rain said, Of course it does, Richard. Of course it does. Uh... Then Bay wondered aloud if demons haunted friends of the Smurls who'd been in the house. Janet said, Unfortunately, yes. Then she related several of the more unnerving experiences of friends of theirs. Finally, it was time for questions from the audience. One woman, obviously upset, said, Could demons follow any of us in the audience home? Nervous giggles. It's possible, I said, but probably unlikely. I went on to tell them that simply by discussing demons here, we were giving the dark world recognition. So, I said, I envisioned the entire audience in Christ's light before the show began, just in case. Another woman in the audience talked of an experience she'd had with a Ouija board and how it had told her she was going to hell. Lorraine promptly cautioned the audience and viewers about using Ouija boards, and said that in the majority of the cases she and I investigate, people had invited the demons in by first communicating with the supernatural world through such tools as the boards. There were other audience questions, and as always, we found that those who'd come to scoff turned out to be the most interested of all in the twin subjects of supernatural and paranormal phenomena. Janet and Jack never relaxed, however. Lorraine and I kept looking in their direction and smiling. You have to appreciate what they were going through. 
They had a terrible night, and now they were being asked to reveal some of their most intimate secrets for a television audience. It wasn't the kind of soul-searching most of us would want to do in public. Richard Bay's final question was the most somber one of all. He asked what I thought was the ultimate goal of the demon. I answered him simply, it wants to destroy the Smurl families. Why? In our experience, we've found that diabolical forces hate loving families. The Smurls live in the image of God, and this, the demon, finds totally repugnant. So it wants to destroy them. They wanted to know if we could stop the demon. I'm hopeful we can, I said. I wish my words had sounded more confident and purposeful, but given all that had happened over the last few months and thinking back to some of our other cases, I knew that occasionally demons did triumph for a time until psychic investigators and ordained members of the clergy could figure out deterrence. The show finished, the audience gave the smiles long and warm applause, and I could see in the tired faces of yeah. the couple something like gratitude. I know. Afterward, Janet said, the audience was very nice to us. Lorraine said, they knew you were telling the truth, and they respected your voice. Jack said to me, what do we do next? All we can do is wait and see what happens. We need to be in constant contact on the phone. Janet said, her eyes misting over, right now, I'd just like to see our kids. Lorraine leaned over and kissed her on the cheek. That sounds like a good idea. Hmm. Why don't you leave now? You can be home before supper time. From the parking lot, we waved goodbye, smiling all the time. But when we were alone, they said, I wish I felt better about this. I know, Lorraine said. I know. I'm almost afraid of what's going to happen in the next few days. If the demon was angry enough to follow them here, she didn't have to finish the sentence. The demon retaliates. For the next yeah. two weeks, life at the Smurl Duplex in West Pittston became nearly intolerable. Just as the Warrens feared, the haunting increased in ferocity. Mary, the day Janet and Jack appeared on the TV show was one of the worst days ever on our side of the house. The banging got so loud at one point that we actually had to leave the house. Finally, the noise quieted down enough that we could go back inside with the girls. But then the banging started up on Janet and Jack's side. It was loud enough that it kept us up all night. John, the same day I started experiencing the psychic colds again. It was like something was drawing the heat from my body. I remember shivering so hard that I was afraid my teeth were going to crack. Given our heart condition, the doctor said the worst thing that could happen to us. But we were all under constant, constant stress. Three nights later asleep, Janet Smurl sensed the covers being eased sinuously off her body and cast on the floor. As her eyes started to flutter open and her head began to rush with the disorienting feeling of losing control of her body, she saw that she was now suspended in midair. What was even more startling was that, in a perfectly prone position, she was being floated across the room. As if she were undergoing some lighter-than-gravity experience, she bumped into the bedroom wall, then bounced away. Then the demon quit having fun with her and hurt her viciously. Janet, me. You went through some trouble obviously it's not something I'll ever forget. Uh, it twisted me around several times and then hurled me into the far wall. The Just before I crashed, I crossed my hands over my skull so to protect it from the collision. Then the demon turned me over very quickly and at such an angle that my hands and arms were outstretched. I only had a few seconds to put myself into the fetal position because I could see the demon was going to catapult me again into the wall, this time trying to break my hands and arms. All the time this was happening, I was screaming for Jack to wake up, really pleading with him. But of course the demon had seen to it that Jack was in a deep psychic sleep. 
Has it what happens if finally, while we go about I can't even really describe. Completely oblivious? All I could think of was Honestly, being in a trance. Sure. I saw everything in our shadowy bedroom very clearly, but at the same time I had the sense that I was caught I between see. worlds. This one and the life after, almost as if I was hanging between life and death itself. And then suddenly, I was lying next to Jack, and I was sobbing, really out of control. And he woke up and tried to calm me down, asking me what had happened. And I showed him the bruises from where the demon had slammed me into the wall. And then I went back to sobbing again. I was afraid I'd really been pushed over the edge. Let's you know the feeling? The calling card at once. When you just can't handle things anymore. That's how I was. I really couldn't deal with things anymore. A calling Jack's card. test on the edge would come the you following take night. Serious thing. Jack. He's famous after all. He the kids knew what had happened to their mother, being levitated and all, so no, they let her rest all day and did all the housework the themselves, then even helped with dinner. Wait. They could see I how precarious her health was getting. Lady. I told her to call in Lorraine while I was at work, just to keep her calm. Well, she did, and talking to them helped a lot. When I got home, we had dinner and watched a little TV. Janet was exhausted and drained, so we put the kids to bed early and then sacked out early ourselves. According to the digital clock, I was asleep about a half hour before I heard the thing. The thing Jack referred to was a creature roughly eight feet in height that stood on two legs but had, on top of its wide shoulders, a furry head with blinding red eyes and a bit like snout. Standing at the end of the bed, the creature slavered and slobbered, then clawed at the air with rake-like fingers, seeming to threaten Jack with evisceration. Even more repugnant than the shape of the creature's face was the slobbering noises of its lips, which resembled pieces of liver as they took in air and saliva. Janet. Jack's scream woke me up and almost instantly, I started screaming too, even though by then the creature he described was gone. I'd never seen Jack that shaken by anything before. He'd thrown himself off the bed and lay in a ball in the middle of the floor. In the moonlight you could see that his whole body was covered in sweat. His hands were in fists that he kept pounding against the floor. I couldn't tell which emotion was stronger than his, fear or anger. The whole family was going through that. We were tired of being afraid. Yet we didn't want to give in to the demon either. I went over and lay down on the floor next to Jack and slowly began to run my hand softly up and down his back, trying to calm him down. His breathing was still coming in big, gasping chunks. It took me ten minutes to get him calmed down. Across the room, as if she were undergoing some lighter than grief after, almost as if I was hanging between life and death, it's... We were tired of being afraid. Sacked out early ourselves. According to the digital clock, I was asleep about a half hour before I heard the thing. We meet again. The thing Jack it referred to was a creature lovely. roughly eight feet in height. That stood on two legs, but had on top of its wide shoulders a furry head with blinding red eyes Don't and a few like snout. Must have been my Standing at the end of the bed, anyway, the creature slavered and slobbered, then clawed at the air it's with rake like fingers, seeming to threaten Jack with evisceration. Even more repugnant than the this. shape of the creature's face was the slobbering noises of its lips, which resembled pieces of liver as they took in air and saliva. Janet. Jack's scream woke me up and almost instantly me, I started screaming too, even though by then about. the creature he described was gone. Please excuse me. I'd never me. seen Jack that shaken by anything before. What is it? He'd thrown himself off the bed and lay in a ball in the middle of the floor. In the moonlight you could it's, see that his whole body was uh, covered in sweat. His hands were in fists that he kept pounding against the floor. Sir, you sign I couldn't wrong. tell which emotion was stronger than him, fear or anger. You are the whole an artist who uses his authority to we were shamelessly tired of being steal afraid. the ideas of his pupils. Yet we didn't want to give we in to the demon either. To make you confess I went over and lay down on the floor next to Jack and slowly began to we run my hands softly up and down his back, trying to calm From him down. The his breathing was still coming in big, gasping Who's chunks. Who's doing this? It took me we ten don't minutes know. to get him calmed down. The same letter's been posted everywhere. Then he said to me, Now I know what hell's going to look like. He tried there describing no signs the creature the to me again, but was a he'd run out of words that could do the job. Remove these I wasn't all that interested in imagining the thing anyway. 
I didn't need much convincing uh, that the form the demon had assumed was disgusting. I had plenty of my own experience yeah, with it. The I got Jack in bed, just a break, went down the hall, and got him a drink of water. When I came back, he had a rosary in his hands. True? His lips were moving it. silently in prayer. But it was his eyes I kept staring at. He was still in a kind of shock. Obviously, he couldn't forget what he'd just seen. He stayed awake all night. Just like that. Over the next few weeks, several of the Warren team members visited the Smurls and they returned with increasingly bizarre accounts of what life at the Smurl house had become. Gloria Damaski, Janet's mother, on a visit to the Smurl home, heard a voice resembling Jack calling her. Yet when she investigated, she found that it was not Jack at all, but a voice that appeared from nowhere. A few days later, Mary Smurl heard a similar voice calling her. Again, when she checked through the house, she found nothing. The following day, Jack was attacked at 2 a.m. by invisible forces that scalded his legs with some kind of intense heat. Only holy water doused the ceiling pain. Janet and Jack were kept up all night by the phone ringing on and on. This woke and upset the girls, and the couple spent much of the night trying to convince the girls everything was alright. The next night, banging in the walls began again in a series of three knocks, a signal for the demon. The same night around 3 a.m., the phone started in again. Three rings in each burst, and so the family, including all the girls, simply got out of bed and went down to the kitchen, where Janet made everybody sandwiches. Janet found humor in the situation. What a ridiculous way to have a picnic, she told her family, as the wall banging continued. The next night's incident was not so funny. The heat being very intense, West Pittston was setting records. Janet and Jack slept wearing very little, and with all the covers except the sheet pushed on the floor. Down the street a dog barked. A motorcycle carrying a young couple out on a late date zoomed down the street. The shadows of heavy maple leaves played against Jack's sleeping form. Janet watched her husband fondly. During the trial of the last few years, she'd grown to admire and respect him more than ever. Janet. It was while I was lying there, getting very sentimental about our relationship, that I sensed the mist gathering. It was a very fine mist, almost like an ocean spray, and I felt it before I saw it. I remember trying to touch my face, and then I realized that I couldn't move my arm. I was in some kind of hypnotic state. Then the man appeared. He had very bright, almost neon eyes that were a mixture of yellow and green, and two animal horns protruded from his head. Strangely, he also had a very bushy mustache. There's an enemy inside, just the as mist expected. covered his face, I mean, so that I could not get a careful look at his features. Just the eyes, anyway, burning in the hollows of his face. So I had no doubt guys. what he wanted, and I remember wishing I was wearing more clothes. I knew I needed to break through the spell she had cast if I was going to avoid what he wanted from me. Several times I tried calling out, but no words came from my throat. And then I said to help Mary. I could hear my voice cracking and sounding like a child since it was so weak. But at least I could hear it. As I said the first words of the Hail Mary, I could see that the creature's eyes glowed with an even deeper hatred of me. Then good? suddenly my voice became very loud, I suppose out of desperation, and I saw the creature start to dematerialize. My arms started to function again. I grabbed the bottle of holy water and sprinkled some of the creature. And finally, it disappeared entirely. And Panther as well. Jack. It was time for drastic measures, and both of us knew it. We had to look at the upside and the downside. The upside being, of course, that if we went public, revealed our names and identities, somebody might hear our story and contact us with the information we needed to sweep our home clean of the haunting. We hoped that there was somebody else out there who had gone through the same things so and might have some wisdom for us. Certainly we couldn't be the only people who'd ever had this sort of supernatural experience. We even felt, as we sat and talked about it, that when the priests at the diocese office heard about it, they would be shamed into helping us. How could they refuse us when our plea was so public? The downside was what we feared all along. But once the public heard our story, they would turn against us. See us as lunatics or publicity seekers. Both Janet and I are proud people, especially where our children are concerned. And we did not want to see them subjected to ridicule and suspicion. 
But the longer we talked about it, the more we realized we had to do it. Go public Indeed. and see if we could find help. <coughs> at the risk of exposing ourselves to ridicule. Ed Warren. The Sunday of that week, the Smells called us after having a long meeting in a restaurant in which they decided to really go public with their story. Not even hide behind a screen to conceal their faces or identity. Lorraine and I believed that Janet and Jack's sudden desire to find a public possibility that the Scranton Diocese would have to recognize at last. Then the phone started in again. Three rings in each purse. And so the family, including all the girls, simply got out of bed and went down to the kitchen where Janet made everybody sandwiches. Janet found humor in the situation. What a ridiculous way to have a picnic, she told her family as the wall banging continued. The next night's incident was not so much. The heat being very intense, no West Pittston was no setting chance. records. Janet and Jack were left wearing very little, oh and with all the covers right. except the sheet pushed on the floor. Down the street, a dog barked. A motorcycle this carrying a young couple out on a late date zoomed down the street. The shadows of heavy maple leaves played well, against Jack's sleeping form. Janet watched her husband fondly. During the trial of the last few this. years, she'd grown to admire and respect him more than ever. Janet. Dude, why is Mona getting excited? It was while I was lying there, getting very sentimental about our relationship, that I sensed the mist gathering. It was a very fine mist, almost like an ocean spray, and I felt it before I saw it. I remember trying to touch my face, and then this is the I realized that I couldn't move my arm. I was in some kind of hypnotic state. Then the man appeared. He had very bright, almost neon eyes that were a mixture of yellow and green, and two for? animal horns protruded from his head. Strangely, he also had a very bushy mustache. So the mist covered his face, so that I could not get a careful look at his features, just the eyes burning in the hollows of his face. I had no doubt what he wanted, and I remember wishing I was wearing more clothes. I knew I needed to break through the spell he had cast if I was going to avoid what he wanted from me. Several times I tried calling out, but no words came from my throat. And then I said to Hail Mary. I could hear my voice cracking and sounding like a child. It was so weak, but at least I could hear it. As I said the first words of the Hail Mary, I could see that the creature's eyes glowed with an even deeper hatred of me. Then suddenly my voice became very loud, I suppose out of desperation, and I saw the creature start to dematerialize. My arms started to function again. I grabbed the bottle of holy water and sprinkled some of the creature. And finally, it disappeared entirely. Jack. It was time for drastic measures, and both of us knew it. We had to look at the upside and the downside. The upside being, of course, that if we went public, revealed our names and identities, somebody might hear our story and contact us with the information we needed to sweep our home clean of the haunting. We hoped that there was somebody else out there who had gone through the same things and might have some wisdom for us. Certainly, we couldn't be the only people who'd ever had this sort of supernatural experience. We even felt, as we sat and talked that about it, that truth. when the priests at the diocese I office heard about it, they were ashamed of the helping us. How could they refuse us when our plea was you so public? The downside was what we feared all along. But once the public heard our story, they would turn against us. See us as lunatics or publicity seekers. Both Janet and I are proud people, especially where our children are concerned, and we did not want to see them subjected to ridicule and suspicion. But the longer we talked about it, the more we realized we had to do it. Go public and see if we could find help, even at the risk of exposing ourselves to ridicule. Ed Warren. The Sunday of that week, the Smurls called us after having a long meeting in a restaurant in which they decided to really go public with their story. Not even hide behind a screen to conceal their faces or identity. Lorraine and I believed that Janet's and Jack's sudden desire to find a public forum offered one very good possibility that the Scranton Diocese would have to recognize at last that something was going on in West Pittston that they had yet to take seriously. 
I also agreed with Jack, well, who spoke that night on the phone, that there was at least a chance that somebody well versed in the history of West Pittston would come forward with a vital piece of information. I also raised the possibility of more exorcisms. Jack said, we've had two. I explained to him that sometimes several exorcisms were necessary, and that we've been involved in cases where scores of exorcisms had to be performed before diabolical entities were driven from a home. She just so happened to have a seizure in front of me. That's when a thought crossed my mind. If I don't call for help and leave her be, I can obtain her painting without any strings attached. No. You let her die? She was physically weak. No one would doubt if she just dropped dead because of a seizure. Above all, Yusuke, didn't you think it was odd that I discovered your talent when you were only three? The reason why I kept you around was to keep you from realizing the truth behind Sayuri! You killed her. The artistic talents you inherited from your mother were a delightful miscalculation, though. If I'm to steal ideas, it's much easier robbing the future of brats who won't talk back than adults. It says to you that I came up with the idea. You have my gratitude. <laughs> Yusuke? I thank you, Madarame. Every reason for me to forgive you has disappeared without a trace at this very moment. You aren't some rotten artist. You're a despicable fiend who wears the skin of an artist. All you good-for-nothings barging into my museum and doing whatever the hell you want! I warned him about the public reaction. I know. Jack died. It could be pretty bad. I chose my next words carefully, not wanting to upset him unduly, but wanting him to understand the gravity of what I was saying. Public reaction starts to have a life of its own, Jack. Very quickly, it can turn into a circus, particularly with the media involved. One day, you can be a hero, and the next day, you can be a scoundrel or a liar. You have to be careful of this, especially when something as volatile as the supernatural is involved. I pause. I just want you to be aware of this. Are you saying not to do it? No. I'm just trying to prepare you. We're friends, Jack. A silence. Then... We have to do it, Ed. You use others we have to. Despicable For all the arguments I'd given him to the contrary, the art you I know it was right. After a supernatural race and at least two incidents that could justify it with called life threatening and with no apparent end in sight, Janet and Jack had no choice but to take the ultimate risk. The risk of exposing themselves to a fickle and sometimes vicious public. The Devil Incarnate. Jack, could you tell us what happened the night the beast appeared to you? It wasn't a happy time. Meaning? I am thou. Meaning, we were beginning to wonder if anything we did would help our circumstances. Could you explain? Well, this was a few days after we decided to go public with our story. I see. And it was a few weeks after our appearance on television. Had you had any reaction to your appearance on the Richard Bay show? That was the problem. We'd gotten many sympathetic phone calls, at least none of the kooks called up. But unfortunately, no one was able to help us with our problem. About the best they could do was wish us well. So this was a depressing time. Yes, as you know, the haunting activities had been intense. The dark form appeared in Shannon's room in the middle of the night, and I got very worried about her. We couldn't stop her crying. We'd never seen her this grief-stricken. She just couldn't be calmed down, no matter what we said or did. Did something happen to Dawn, too? Yes. She woke up at five one morning and went downstairs to get a glass of water. On her way down, she heard three loud knocks on the front door. She came upstairs to get me, but when I got down there, 
the dark form appeared at Shannon's room in the middle of the night. Yeah. We got very worried about her. We couldn't stop her crying. We'd never seen her this grief-stricken. She just couldn't be calmed down no matter what we said or did. Did something happen to John, too? Yes. She woke up at five one morning and went downstairs to get a glass of water. On her way down, she heard three loud knocks on the front door. She came upstairs to get me, but when I got down there, nobody was there. We both went back to bed, and then for the next 15 minutes, it really gave Janet and me a show. Banging inside the closet, slamming the drawers in the triple dresser, and flipping dresser handles up and down. But then, that had been pretty much standard operating procedure for the past few weeks. Following the TV show, it seems to have this need to reestablish its dominance. Would you tell us about the incident with Simon? I was lying in bed. Jenna was asleep, but I was having trouble nodding off, so I just lay there smoking a cigarette in the darkness when I heard Simon beginning to gasp. That's the only way I could describe it. He just couldn't get his breath. This terrible feeling came over me. I love Simon almost as much as I do my own children. I started to get up from the bed to see what was wrong with him when I felt this presence in bed next to me. Now, I never saw this presence, but I sensed it. There was this huge heartbeat, very regular and very loud, filling the room. And then something gripped my right arm so tight, I thought it was going to literally crush it. Then a really fetid odor started to fill my nostrils, and I was afraid I was going to pass out. I jerked my left hand toward the nightstand. I can remember the sound of several things being knocked to the floor, but I didn't care. And somehow, I got the holy water, and I sprinkled it across myself and said the prayer that Ed and Lorraine had taught us. And finally, it was gone. How about Simon? By the time I reached him, he was alright, thank God. He was scared, you could tell that. He was curled up in the corner and still kind of whimpering very low, but when I started petting him, he calmed down. Then you went back to bed? Yes. And did anything else happen that night? Yes, uh, a little later on, I went down to the bathroom, and that's when I saw it. Nothing I'd seen before could have prepared me for it. Can you describe it for us? I'll try. I wish I was better at this kind of thing. It was huge, for one thing. It had two animal legs. Uh, I'd say they resembled a horse's legs. And part of its face was human, and part of the snout, I guess, was that of an animal. With black, wet nostrils and brown fur over most of its skull and face. It had rounded hips that were covered with fur, and eyes that kind of shone. There's no other way to describe it. They shown, but at the same time, they were human, too. It saw me and slashed at the air with hands, or hooves that looked partly human and looked partly animal. It made a snorting sound that almost made me nauseous to hear. I got all this in a glimpse as soon as I turned the light on, and almost immediately the creature charged at me. The most threatening thing about it was its sheer size. This thing was at least seven feet tall. All I could think of was that a horse and a human had been grafted together in a real crude way. And then the thing was swiping the air at me. What did you do? I ran down the hall. I came after you. Most definitely. Even though our hallway is carpeted, it was running so hard after me that you could hear the stomping sounds its hoofs made on the rug. This sound first started to fill my nostrils, and I was afraid I was going to pass out. Meaning, we were beginning to wonder if anything we did would help our circumstances. Could you explain? Well, this was a few days after we decided to go public with our story. I see. And it was a few weeks after our appearance on television. Had you had any reaction to your appearance on the Richard Bay show? That was the problem. We'd gotten many sympathetic phone calls, at least none of the kooks called up. But unfortunately, no one was able to help us with our problem. About the best they could do was wish us well. So this was a depressing time. Yes, as you know, the haunting activities had been intense. The dark form appeared in Shannon's room in the middle of the night, and I got very worried about her. We couldn't stop her crying. We'd never seen her this grief stricken. She just couldn't be calmed down, no matter what we said or did. Did something happen to Dawn, too? Yes. She woke up at five one morning and went downstairs to get a glass of water. 
On her way down, she heard three loud knocks on the front door. She came upstairs to get me, but when I got down there, nobody was there. We both went back to bed, and then for the next 15 minutes, it really gave Janet and me a show. Banging inside the closet, slamming the drawers in the triple dresser, and flipping dresser handles up and down. But then, that had been pretty much standard operating procedure for the past few weeks. Following the TV show, it seemed to have this need to reestablish its dominance. Would you tell us about the incident with Simon? I was lying in bed. Janet was asleep, but I was having trouble nodding off, so I just lay there smoking a cigarette in the darkness when I heard Simon beginning to gasp. That's the only way I could describe it. He just couldn't get his breath. This terrible feeling came over me. I love Simon almost as much as I do my own children. I had started to get up from the bed to see what was wrong with him when I felt this presence in bed next to me. Now, I never saw this presence, but I sensed it. There was this huge heartbeat, very regular and very loud, filling the room. And then something gripped my right arm so tight, I thought it was going to literally crush it. Then a really fetid odor started to fill my nostrils, and I was afraid I was going to pass out. I jerked my left hand toward the nightstand. I can remember the sound of several things being knocked into the floor. It just couldn't get his breath. This terrible feeling came over me. Well, at least none of the kooks called up. But unfortunately, no one was able to help us with our problems. About the best they could do was wish us well. So this was a depressing time. Yes, as you know, the haunting activities had been intense. The dark form appeared in Shannon's room in the middle of the night, and I got very worried about her. We couldn't stop her crying. We'd never seen her this grief before. She just couldn't be calmed down, no matter what we said or did. Did something happen to Dawn, too? Yes. She woke up at five one morning and went downstairs to get a glass of water. On her way down, she heard three loud knocks on the front door. She came upstairs to get me, but when I got down there, nobody was there. We both went back to bed, and then for the next 15 minutes, it really gave Janet and me a show. Banging inside the closet, triple dresser, and flipping dresser handles up and down. There's no time. But then, that had been pretty much standard operating procedure for the past few weeks. Following the TV show, it seemed to have this need to reestablish its dominance. What should I do? Would you tell us about the incident with Simon? I was lying in bed. Janet was asleep, but I was having trouble nodding off, so I just lay there smoking a cigarette in the darkness when I heard Simon beginning to gasp. That's the only way I could describe it. He just couldn't get his breath. This terrible feeling came over me. I love Simon almost as much as I do my own children. I had started to get up from the bed to see what was wrong with him when I felt this presence in bed next to me. Now, I never saw this presence, but I sensed it. There was this huge heartbeat, very regular and very loud, filling the room. And then something gripped my right arm so tight, I thought it was going to literally crush it. Then a really fetid odor started to fill my nostrils, and I was afraid I was going to pass out. I jerked my left hand toward the nightstand. I can remember the sound of several things being knocked to the floor, but I didn't care. And somehow, I got the holy water and I sprinkled it across myself and said the prayer that Ed and Lorraine had taught us. And then finally, it was gone. How about Simon? By the time I reached him, he was alright, thank God. He was scared, you could tell that. He was curled up in the corner and still kind of whimpering very low, but when I started petting him, he calmed down. Then you went back to bed. Yes. And did anything else happen that night? Yes, uh, a little later on, I went down to the bathroom, and that's when I saw it. Nothing I'd seen before could have prepared me for it. Can you describe it for us? I'll try. I wish I was better at this kind of thing. It was huge, for one thing. It had two animal legs. I'd say they resembled a horse's legs. And part of its face was human, and part, the snout, I guess, was that of an animal. With black, wet nostrils and brown fur over most of its skull and face. It had rounded hips that were covered with fur, and eyes that kind of shone. There's no other way to describe it. They shone, but at the same time, they were human, too. It saw me and slashed at the air with hands, or hooves so that looked partly Jesus. human and looked partly animal. What are you gonna do? It made a snorting sound that almost made me nauseous Why to hear. Do do such things? 
I got all this in a glimpse as soon as they turned the light on in. Almost immediately the creature charged at me. The most threatening thing about it was its sheer size. This thing was at least seven feet tall. All I could think of was that a horse and a human had been grafted together in a real crude way. And then the thing was swiping the air at me. What did you do? I ran down the hall. No whether it'll turn out good it came after you. Or not. Most Still, definitely. We won't Even though our hallway is carpeted, trash. it was running so hard Maybe after me that you could hear the stomping sound its hooves made on the rug. Hmm? The this sounds something like a creature you'd seen a few weeks earlier. It was, very definitely. But there was something attacked. more terrifying about this one. If we what did you do? Palaces, I got into bed, pressed myself there, back against the headboard, and started to reach for the holy water. Started to. The thing was still slashing at the air. I won't take then what? Any then I grabbed a prayer book from the nightstand and no lifted it toward the creature, and then it ran across the bed. Across the bed? Yes, it was real. Uh, I could smell it and hear it and feel it running across the bed. But then it just vanished into the wall. You're sure it wasn't a dream? No, because as I sat there, and I was really shaken. I was nearly in tears, and no matter what I tried, their handles up and down. But then, that had been pretty much standard operating procedure for the past few weeks. Following the TV show, it seemed to have this need to reestablish its dominance. Would you tell us about the incident with Simon? I was lying in bed, Janet was asleep, but I was having trouble nodding off, so I just lay there smoking a cigarette in the darkness when I heard Simon beginning to gasp. That's the only way I can describe it. He just couldn't get his breath. This terrible feeling came over me. I love Simon almost as much as I do my own children. I had started to get up from the bed to see what was wrong with him when I felt this presence in bed next to me. Now, I never saw this presence, but I sensed it. There was this huge heartbeat, very regular and very loud, filling the room. And then something gripped my right arm so tight, I thought it was going to literally crush it. Then a really fetid odor started to fill my nostrils, and I was afraid I was going to pass out. I jerked their handles up and the death first started to fill my nostrils and I was afraid I was going to pass out. Tell us about the incident with Simon. I was lying in bed. Janet was asleep, but I was having trouble nodding off, so I just lay there smoking a cigarette in the darkness when I heard Simon beginning to gasp. That's the only way I can describe it. He just couldn't get his breath. This terrible feeling came over me. I love Simon almost as much as I do my own children. I had started to get up from the bed to see what was wrong with him when I felt this presence in bed next to me. Now, I never saw this presence, but I sensed it. There was this huge heartbeat, very regular and very loud, filling the room. And then something gripped my right arm so tight, I thought it was going to literally crush it. Then a really fetid odor started to fill my nostrils, and I was afraid I was going to pass out. I jerked my left hand toward the nightstand. I can remember the sound of several things being knocked into the floor, but I didn't care. And somehow, I got the holy water, and I sprinkled it across myself, and said the prayer that Ed and Lorraine had taught us. And then finally, it was gone. I held up Simon. By the time I reached him, he was all right. Thank God. He was scared. You could tell that. He was curled up in the corner, still kind of whimpering very low, but when I started petting him, he calmed down. Then you went back to bed. Yes. And did anything else happen that night? Yes, uh, a little later on, I went down to the bathroom, and that's when I saw it. Nothing I'd seen before could have prepared me for it. Can you describe it for us? I'll try. I wish I was better at this kind of thing. It was huge, for one thing. It had two animal legs. Uh, I'd say they resembled a horse's legs. And part of its face was human, and part, the sound, I guess, was that of an animal, with black, wet nostrils and brown fur over most of its skull and face. It had rounded hips that were covered with fur, and eyes that kind of shone. There's no other way to describe it. They shone, but at the same time, they were human, too. It saw me and slashed at the air with hands, or hooves, that looked partly human and looked partly animal. It made a snorting sound that almost made me nauseous to hear. I got all this in a glimpse as soon as I turned the light on, and almost immediately the creature charged at me. The most threatening thing about it was its sheer size. This thing was at least seven feet tall. 
All I could think of was that a horse and a human had been grafted together in a real crude way. And then the thing was swiping the air at me. What did you do? I ran down the hall. It came after you? Most definitely. Even though our hallway is carpeted, it was running so hard after me that you could hear the stomping sounds its hoofs made on the rug. Yeah. This sounds something like the creature you'd seen a few weeks earlier. It was, very definitely. But there was something more terrifying about this one. What did you do? I got into bed and pressed myself back against the headboard and started to reach for the holy water. Started to. The thing was still slashing at the air. Then what? Then I grabbed a prayer book from the nightstand and lifted it toward the creature, and then it ran across the bed. Across the bed? Yes, it was real. I could smell it and hear it and feel it running across the bed. But then it just vanished into the wall. You're sure it wasn't a dream? No, because as I sat there, and I was really shaken, I was nearly in tears, and no matter what I tried, I, I couldn't wake Janet up. It seems another I could smell its odor in the room. The so could Janet when she did wake up. Didn't that make you think twice about going public? Beyond mine, no. But in an odd way, it made up our minds that going public was the only thing left to us. Because the entity was really going berserk. Mary and John were being bothered again, spending many sleepless nights because of the banging. And then even our neighbors started being hauled into our situation. Which neighbors were those? Daniel and Louise Harrington. Statement of Louise Harrington. All right. A few months before, strange things began happening to my family. My husband Daniel, who was an insurance representative. My 21-year-old daughter Julie. My 16-year-old son Daryl. Janet Smurl had told me some of the things that had occurred in her home. As a licensed practical nurse, I've seen the ravages of mental illness close up. The absolute belief on the part of a psychotic personality that something took place when in fact it didn't. While I certainly didn't think Janet or anyone in her family was psychotic, her revelations were so odd that I frankly didn't know what to make of them. These days, because of movies and television, we all have at least a rudimentary understanding of the occult. But what Janet told me was unlike anything I'd seen on a screen. Most of it wasn't as dramatic. In what she told me, there weren't any monsters per se. But lighting fixtures would drop from the ceiling and terrible odors filled the house. And there was almost constant banging in the walls. Coming from Janet, who was a very level-headed person, it was all plausible. But still, I had to wonder if her imagination hadn't run away with her. In the summer of 1986, I abruptly and convincingly found out otherwise. On hot summer nights, my husband and I often stay up late and watch TV. Even with all the windows open, the house is too hot for any prolonged sleep. You wake up bathed in sweat. This particular summer night was setting heat records, so we sat in front of the television, watching a crime movie and sipping iced tea. It was two in the morning, and the movie had just started. The next day was Saturday, so we could sleep late. The movie had been running for perhaps five minutes when the screaming started. At first it was so horrible it almost sounded fake. By which I mean there's a way women scream in the movies that rarely resembles the way they scream in real life. This sounded more like a movie scream. Do you know the answer? The screaming went on for no longer than a minute, then faded. My god. Well done. My husband said, What was that? I'm not sure, I said. He got up and went out on the front porch and looked around and came back in. Didn't see anything. My heart pounding. We waited a few more minutes before allowing ourselves to get caught up in the movie again. We'd been watching it another 20 minutes when the screaming came again. This time it was so piercing and ragged and threatening that it literally lifted me off the couch. It's coming from the Smurl house, All right. Daniel said. But that's impossible, I said. Janet told me that the whole family was going camping this weekend. We saw them leaving this morning, remember? God, you're right, Daniel said. But what the... Then another burst of screaming exploded on the night air. Because our house is very near the Smurls, the sound of the woman shrieking might as well have been coming from our own living room. 
Daniel went to the side window and looked up at the Sparrow House. As the screaming continued, he said, It seems to be coming from Don and Kim's room. And that seemed to be the case. I scanned the Sparrow House carefully, listening to the tortured sounds, even though they were beginning to really frighten and somehow aggravate me. But who could be in there? I asked. He reminded me of what Janet had said about the haunting. All I could think about was ghosts running around in sheets, like children on Halloween. But I knew that what we were dealing with here was real and serious. Maybe even deadly. Neither of us slept well that night, and so we could sleep late. The movie had been running for perhaps five minutes when the screaming started. At first it was so horrible it almost sounded fake. By which I mean there's a way women scream in the movies that rarely resembles the way they scream in real life. This sounded more like a movie scream. What would you like? The screaming went on for no longer than a minute, then Thank faded. You. What would you like? My god. My husband said, What was that? I'm not sure. Here. I said. Hmm. He got up and went out on the front porch and looked around and came back in. Didn't see anything. Hmm. My heart pounding. We waited a few more minutes before allowing ourselves to get caught up in the movie again. We'd been watching it another 20 minutes when the screaming came again. This time it was so piercing and ragged and threatening that it literally lifted me off the couch. It's coming from the Smurl house, Daniel said. But that's impossible, I said. Janet told me that the whole family was going camping this weekend. Okay. We saw them leaving this morning, remember? Be grateful. God, you're right, Daniel said. But what the... Then another burst of screaming exploded on the night air. Because our house is very near the Smurls, the sound of the woman shrieking might as well have been coming from our own living room. Daniel went to the side window and looked up at the Smurl house. As the screaming continued, he said, It seems to be coming from Don and Kim's room. And that seemed to be the case. I scanned the Smurl house carefully, listening to the tortured sounds, even though they were beginning to really frighten and somehow aggravate me. But who could be in there? I asked. He reminded me of what Janet had said about the haunting. All I could think about was ghosts running around in sheets, like children on Halloween. But I knew that what we were dealing with here was real and serious. Maybe even deadly. Neither of us slept well that night. We kept getting up to check on the children. Instinctively, we seemed to understand that the force operating in the Smurl house, and by now, we had no doubt that what Janet had been telling us was absolutely real, might somehow threaten our children. As soon as Janet and Jack returned, we went over to their duplex and told them about our experience. They shared with us some advice given them by their friends Ed Lorraine Warren, and told us to pray that the entity would not include us in its plans. A few nights later, Daniel and I discovered that the entity had indeed decided to inflict itself on our lives. Scream in real life. This sounded more like a movie scream. The screaming went on for no longer than a minute, then faded. My god, my husband said. What was that? I'm not sure, I said. He got up and went out on the front porch and looked around and came back in. Didn't see anything. My heart pounding. We waited a few more minutes before allowing ourselves to get caught up in the movie again. We'd been watching it another 20 minutes when the screaming came again. This time it was so piercing and ragged and threatening that it literally lifted me off the couch. It's coming from the Smurl house, Daniel said. But that's impossible, I said. Janet told me that the whole family was going camping this weekend. We saw them leaving this morning, remember? God, you're right, Daniel said. But what the... Then another burst of screaming exploded on the night air. Because our house is very near the Smurls, the sound of the woman shrieking might as well have been coming from our own living room. Daniel went to the side window and looked up at the Smurl house. As the screaming continued, he said, It seems to be coming from Don and Kim's room. And that seemed to be the case. I scanned the Smurl house carefully, listening to the tortured sounds, even though they were beginning to really frighten and somehow aggravate me. But who could be in there? I asked. He reminded me of what Janet had said about the haunting. All I could think about was ghosts running around in sheets, like children on Halloween. But I knew that what we were dealing with here was real and serious. Maybe even deadly. 
neither of us slept well that night. We kept getting up to check on the children. Instinctively, we seemed to understand that the force operating in the small house, and by now, we had no doubt that what Janet had been telling us was absolutely real, might somehow threaten our children. As soon as Janet and Jack returned, we went over to their duplex and told them about our experience. They shared with us some advice given them by their friends Ed and Lorraine Warren, and told us to pray that the entity would not include us in its plans. A few nights later, Daniel and I discovered that the entity had indeed decided to inflict itself on our Morning. lives. Our daughter Julie is a college student. If the word normal can apply to anybody, it most certainly applies to her. Spending the bulk of her time in a world of pizza, rock and roll, boys, and fortunately a very serious attitude toward her studies. Around 2 a.m., I was watching TV after work. I work a late shift and am keyed up when I get home. My husband was asleep in the front bedroom, and Daryl was asleep in the middle bedroom. Julie's bedroom is at the end of the house. Julie was awakened by the sound of scratching at the window. The window does not have any trees or bushes around it and is on the second floor. She wondered if somebody might be trying to break in. Of course, I knew none of this until she came downstairs and said, There's something in my room, Mom, and it's ice cold up there. Then she told me about the scratching. I didn't know what to make of it, so being protective, I asked her to come over and sit with me. Her fear was catching. I was afraid to go into her room as well. She sat with me until four or so, and then I walked her back to her room. Neither of us slept well that night. Unfortunately for my daughter, this was not to be her only experience with the supernatural. For real? A week after the scratching incident, she came running downstairs in her yellow nightgown. She looked to be freezing, her arms folded tightly across her chest, her teeth chattering. I wondered if she'd suddenly gotten a fever. Julie. I drifted off to sleep, and when I started to wake up, I realized that my whole body was covered with goosebumps and was trembling. Sometimes in the winter, you kick the covers off yourself while you're asleep, and you wake up and you're really freezing. It was like that, only worse. My whole body was shaking. I couldn't stop. By the time I got completely awake, it was like I was inside a meat blocker. Really. The thing was, this was a very hot summer night. And again, I felt this presence in the room with me. The temptation was just to lie there because I was still drowsy, but I knew that something serious would happen to me if I didn't force myself up out of bed and go find my mother. When I asked Janet Smurl about Julie's experience, she told me it was something that had happened to her daughters many times. I also described to Janet other curious things that had been happening. Our front door opening and closing by itself in the middle of the night. At first, I thought it might be our other son, Eddie, coming in late. But I went downstairs to have a look, and there it was. Opening and closing. It happened twice, with nobody in sight. Of course, Janet knew firsthand that my family was getting drawn into the Smurl haunting. My son Daryl was at the Smurl house one afternoon with Dawn and her cousin Scott Bloom. Dawn and Scott went into the kitchen, leaving Daryl alone in the living room. He sat there several minutes by himself reading a magazine, and then he heard tapping sounds coming from the coffee table. He looked under the table but found nothing. He couldn't see anything that could cause such tapping. Gradually, he came to understand that there was a presence in the room. The tapping continued as Don and Scott came back into the room. Daryl described to Don what had been happening. Don't worry, Don said. You get used to it. But Daryl felt curiously exhausted, drained. Later on, Janet explained to me how the entity literally draws on the energy of human beings for sustenance. All I knew when Daryl appeared in the doorway telling me of his tapping experience was that my son looked pale and shaken. I put him to bed immediately. He remained exhausted for many hours. And the haunting continued to be part of our lives. Julie on the phone one day heard the magnetic latch on her closed closet creak open and then after several seconds shut itself again. Julie felt a being in the room with her. She slammed down the phone nice. and ran from the room, terrified. Daniel. Sometimes in the summer, I like to go for walks when I can't sleep. Hey, hey. 
This one night I did that, and when I got home, I saw that the small house was completely dark. Then I remembered they were out of town. I started up the steps to my duplex, and that's when I heard it. This giant fluttering sound moving from window to window inside the small house. You got the impression that some gigantic uh, rock and roll boys and fortunately a very serious attitude toward her studies. The temptation was just to lie there because I was still drowsy, but I knew that something serious would happen to me if I didn't force myself up out of bed and go find my mother. When I asked Janet Smurl about Julie's experience, she told me it was something that had happened to her daughters many times. I also described to Janet other curious things that had been happening. Our front door opening and closing by itself in the middle of the night. At first, I thought it might be our other son, Eddie, coming in late. But I went downstairs to have a look, and there it was. It happened twice, with nobody in sight. Of course, Janet knew firsthand that my family was getting drawn into the small haunting. My son Daryl was at the small house one afternoon with Dawn and her cousin Scott Bloom. Dawn and Scott went into the kitchen, leaving Daryl alone in the living room. He sat there several minutes by himself reading a magazine, and then he heard tapping sounds coming from the coffee table. He looked under the table but found nothing. He couldn't see anything that could cause such tapping. Gradually, he came to understand that there was a presence in the room. The tapping continued as Don and Scott came back into the room. Daryl described to Don what had been happening. Don't worry, Don said. You get used to it. But Daryl felt curiously exhausted, drained. Later on, Janet explained to me how the entity literally draws on the energy of human beings for sustenance. All I knew when Daryl appeared in the doorway telling me of his tapping experience was that my son looked pale and shaken. I put him to bed immediately. He remained exhausted for many hours. And the haunting continued to be part of our lives. Julie on the phone one day heard the magnetic latch on her closed closet creak open and then after several seconds shut itself again. Julie felt a being in the room with her. She slammed down the phone and ran from the room, terrified. Daniel. Sometimes in the summer, I like to go for walks when I can't sleep. This one night, I did that, and when I got home, I saw that the small house was completely dark. Mm. Then I remembered they were out of town. I started up the steps to my duplex, and that's when I heard it. This giant fluttering sound moving from window to window inside the small house. You got the impression that some gigantic bird was trapped inside there and was trying desperately to get out. Then tapping started against the windows. Very sharp tappings, almost like gunshots. I don't mind admitting that I didn't stay around for the rest of the show. I ran up the steps and into the show. That experience was that my son looked pale and shaken. I put him to bed immediately. He remained exhausted for many hours. And the haunting continued to be part of our lives. Yes, yes. Julie on the phone one day Good heard citizens. the magnetic latch Please, on her closed closet creak open and then Where's after the several seconds shut itself again. Julie felt goodness. a being in the room yes, with her. She slammed down the phone and ran from the room, terrified. Daniel. Now, if you'll please excuse me. Sometimes in the summer, I like to go for walks when I can't sleep. Can this one night, I did that, and when I got home, I saw that the small house God, was completely so dark. Righteous. Then I remembered they were out of town. I started up the steps to my duplex, and that's when I heard it. This giant fluttering sound moving from window to window inside the small house. You got the impression that some gigantic bird was trapped inside there and was trying desperately to get out. Then tapping started against the windows. Very sharp tappings, almost like gunshots. I don't mind admitting that I didn't stay around for the rest of the show. I ran up the steps and inside my house, yes. closed all the windows and checked the locks on the doors. Regardless, whenever someone calls me, no only a temporary calls. escape. I panic. I went two weeks after the phone conversation in which Jack Smurl had told Ed Warren that he and Janet had decided to go public. To be a the Smurls had yet to take any steps that would make their decision a reality. 
Jack. We were backed by powerful diet. Every time we go to pick up the phone and call a newspaper or a TV station, one or both of us would say that maybe we'd better think this over a little longer. Looking back, I'd say we were probably trying to stall until some kind of solution presented itself that wouldn't involve revealing ourselves to the media. The prospect of that was still just about as unnerving as the haunting itself. Not that Jack didn't keep in close touch with the Warrens during his time. We talked virtually every day, and what we talked about was an idea I was almost afraid to bring up because it was so radical. But that certainly was my mood at the time. Very radical. I just wanted to be done with the haunting. My idea was simple. I asked Ed and Lorraine if they thought it would be a good idea if we had the house torn down and leveled and then moved away. We would suffer great financial losses, but at least it might be a new start for us. For all of us. Janet and the kids, and my mother and father as well. Now I knew what Ed would say. That the entity had already proved it could follow us, and had in fact followed us to the campground, to the motel in Philadelphia, and even to my office. However, when I looked at everything carefully, I thought I discerned a certain pattern. That even though the entity followed us, when it left the house, it did not seem to commit acts nearly as atrocious as those it committed inside the duplex. So I asked Ed his opinion about us demolishing the house and then moving. And I certainly recall his answer. Ed. The day Jack called and said he was thinking of leveling his home, the home he'd worked all his life to own, I knew that the Smurls were at a very dangerous place. In fact, a part of me wondered if the demon hadn't already defeated the family. The other part of the conversation that bothered me was that Jack was desperately pushing for answers that I could not, in all honesty, provide. Would the spirit follow them? Would the spirit be as malicious in a new place? Would the spirit be with them the rest of their lives? In a few previous cases of infestation, we'd seen this kind of despair before. And it's always heartbreaking to behold. Particularly when you see it in as good and reliable a man as Jack Smurls. A grave injustice had been done to him and his family, and he was asking me, pleading with me really, for help, any kind of help. Now in the form of advice. So that day I did all I could. I said that I did not think that tearing down and leveling his house was a good idea. I said that it would be an expensive and painful process and that there would be no guarantee whatsoever that this would accomplish what he was trying to accomplish. I said that maybe if he thought about it some more, a better plan would evolve, one that would not see him destroy something he and his parents were so proud of. But luckily, he agreed with me. I have to say that after we hung up, I felt very bad. I and Lorraine and I began saying prayers for the Smurl families immediately. We had seen certain families pushed to the brink and subsequently pushed over that brink. What that happened to the Smurls? We wondered. Jack had finished his conversation with Ed that afternoon. The rest of the day, gloomy that none of his ideas were working out, Jack spent in the kitchen making notes about the nearly two years of severe haunting and seeing if any new plans suggested themselves. Without his realizing it, dusk came purple in the window. Janet, finished with the dinner dishes, sat down with Jack and asked if he wanted to talk. He looked haggard, and she was worried about him. Janet. We started talking about a number of options, which included renting a place for a time, but we knew the children's lives would suffer, and we wondered, too, what the impact would be on Mary's life. Then there was the prospect of renting a place with new neighbors, and having them find out through some incident that we were a supernaturally besieged family. I mean, it would be pretty embarrassing to move into an apartment house and have the people below us hear cloven hooves running up and down the hallway. We must have sat there for two hours. The kids got ready for bed and kissed their father goodnight and went upstairs. And we just kept on sitting there, talking about what we could do. Every time we thought nothing could get any worse, it would get worse. And right now was a good example. Here was Jack with a week of vacation. And instead of enjoying ourselves, we were in the kitchen brooding about the haunting. And somewhere in there, the idea came to us. Hey, here you I'm are. not even sure which one of us had the idea I first, and it doesn't matter. Sound. It was just there, and it was something we should have thought of earlier. Something that would, in effect, be the same thing as raising our duplex. 
something that would allow us to see just how bad the infestation had become and what would happen if both small families moved out. By dawn the next morning, we had packed up the van and were sitting off for the campground. We were laughing too. We really felt a sense of optimism. Flight. You know what I mean. Let's give it a try. The experiment both Smurl yeah. families attempted did not work successfully. Really? Mary Smurl was interviewed at length about it. My Mary, what was the experiment all about? We can get in any time. Well, we felt, all of us, that if we all left the entire house so... empty for a week, hey, we'd be able to see how the demon would respond. If it would follow us, and if so, what would it do? So you felt that if you all went to the campground for a week and nothing happened, then you'd be safe to move and the demon wouldn't follow you. Yes. Were you as optimistic as Janet and Jack? At that point, we were ready to try and maybe even believe in just about anything. So it didn't take much convincing to get you to pack your bags and go along in the van. No convincing at all. Your husband, John, felt the same way? Yes. What you have to remember is that within the span of a few short years, we've been forced to move out of our house in Wilkes-Barre because of the flood. And then we finally found a place where we could spend our retirement years. You know what I'm talking about. All John could say over and over the week before we left for the campground was, why does it want to make us suffer? He was worried about my health, and I was starting to worry about his health, too. His health was suffering. Nice. Well, on TV and in the newspapers, you always see material on the relationship between stress and illness. And I think it's hard for most people to understand the kind of stress we've been under. And I mean constant stress. When somebody talks about a knocking in the wall in print, it may not look that threatening, but believe me, when you're sitting in your living room, and all of a sudden something begins banging inside your wall, your whole system responds. According to the article, stress damages your immune system. You could see that all of us were getting colds and flu and headaches, and you certainly didn't have to wonder why. So you were hopeful that a week at the campground would show you a way of escaping. Yes. Even though we put all our money into the duplex, we were willing to lose what we had and start over. We felt that if our faith in God was strong enough, we'd make it. Hello? Hello? So that's why we went to the campground. We even made a pact. A pact? Yes. Janet and Jack and John and I. We said that no matter what happened, no matter where the demon forced us to live, we would continue living together as a family. Janet even said, if we have to leave our house empty and rent a second place to do that, we will. This thing won't beat us. Mm. It won't. It was a very emotional point, and John and I both had tears in our eyes. Can you describe the campground? Oh, it's the sort you see in the Pennsylvania hills. Kind of like a little village, really. When you put all the campers and their cars together, one problem we had right off was the weather. Black rain clouds hung low in the sky and it was chilly for a summer day. Were the rain clouds a portent? You mean like an omen? Yes. <laughs> they could have been. It didn't go so well again. No. What happened? Another long pause. It is obvious to the interviewer that Mary is gathering her strength. She has begun to fidget. The demon attacked my bed in the camper. Would you describe that for us, please? The bed is nailed to the floor. There is no way you can move it. That first night, it was just after midnight, I was asleep in the camper when I heard very hard and rapid rappings on the roof and floor. I started to get up out of my bed, but before I could, I felt the whole bed being ripped from the floor, jerked to the left and then jerked to the right. You could hear the nails tearing at the floor. Did anybody come to help you? I screamed, of course, but one thing about the demon is its speed. The whole incident was over before anybody could reach me. It just stopped. It just stopped. 
okay. Mary's fragile health is never more apparent than during this interview. As she speaks, her eyes take on a curiously luminous quality, and whatever anger she might have for the demon is dissipated by sheer physical weariness. What were your feelings then, Mary, about the whole situation? Long pause. Hmm. It was becoming obvious that not only could the demon follow us, but it could pretty much do what it wanted to. How did the week at the campground go from there? She looks at the interviewer and shakes her head. Her words are barely audible. From there, it only got worse. Bye. Much worse. But hadn't things like this happened when Janet and Jack had visited the campground before? Yes. But what was supposed to be special about this trip was that both families had left the entire house vacant. In a very real sense, we had turned over the house to the demon as a kind of sacrifice. We wanted to see if it would respond by leaving us alone at the campground. So if it had left you alone, then we'd realize that what it wanted was something in the house itself and we'd all vacate. We'd do what Janet had said. We'll rent it if we have to, but we'd move right away and we'd stay together no matter what. So when the demon tried to tear your bed from the floor, what was the reaction? Well, the first thing was, of course, that everybody was very frightened for me. What did they feel about the demon in general? Well, even though we all agreed it was too soon to tell how the week would go for sure, we had a pretty good suspicion, I'm afraid, of what lay ahead for us. <laughs> It turned out to be a terrible week. And I was sorry we had Scott Bloom along because things got pretty tough for everybody. But then, we'd had high hopes that it would be a real vacation. A troubling realization. The time was 3 a.m., the third day of the camping trip. Jack lay awake, still thinking about the incident that had taken place around midnight. When he'd gotten up in response to a shout from his father from a sleeping berth near the front of the camper. I couldn't believe it. John Smurl had anxiously told his son. I felt the whole mattress being lifted up from under me. I was afraid it was going to throw me into the wall. Then I looked out the window. John Smurl had shaken his head exhausted from his encounter with the supernatural. I saw this white form appear outside the window. I'd have to say it was dressed in chiffon and... It stayed there a moment and then just walked away. Just like that. Jack had embraced his father to keep the older man from trembling. A rage rose in Jack, one he knew well by now, one he had no idea what to do about. So now it was 3 a.m. and he lay awake. By now, the fourth day of their camp sojourn just ahead of him, he knew the answer to the question he'd come here to find out. Wherever Jack Smurl went, the entity was going to follow. There in the darkness, moonlight casting long shadows through the camper windows, the scent of wood smoke from the campfire outside pleasant on the air. There in the darkness, the entity responded to Jack Smurl's bitterness. The sound of animal hooves striking the metal roof penetrated the darkness like gunfire. Jack sat upright, bathed in sweat, and wanting to physically attack the unseen force that was tormenting him. He rushed over to the center of the camper, to where the holy water was kept. Armed with a vial of the sacred fluid, he stood up and began sprinkling the water across the ceiling. As he did so, he let his eyes rove out to the campsite, to the guttering fire and the leafy summer oaks encircling them. Sitting on a picnic table bench, looking calm and peaceful like a contented picnicker, was the faceless, cloaked black form that Jack knew to be the demon itself. My bad, man. An anger he'd never known before. A blinding anger that turned him into a being that was as much animal as man. What? Overtook Jack and he smashed into the camper door so hard he nearly took it off its hinges. Janet came Look wide awake that, and jumped up to grab onto her husband. She'd never seen him this furious before. A glance out the window told her why he was so enraged. The black form had followed them. All she could understand at this moment was that she had to stop Jack from confronting the black form. Jack slammed open the door and started down the steps. 
No, Janet cried. You don't know what it will do to you. But Jack seemed not to hear her. His eyes were fixed on the transparent black form sitting on the bench, flames from the guttering fire casting an eerie red glow over its demonic body. In Jack's hand, Janet realized for the first time was a bottle, a weapon. No! She cried again and reached out for Jack, trying to stop him. But it was no use. Jack shrugged off her hands and walked, stalked, really, toward the demon which sat in plain sight as if it was waiting for Jack. Hmm. Janet. Jack had just left the camper when it disappeared as it usually did. Just vanished. I can't tell you the relief I felt. I was so proud of my husband for wanting to defend us, but at the same time, I didn't want to see him hurt. I knew that his anger was just giving the demon a perfect excuse to murder him. And that's what I was praying against. The remaining days of the camping trip went no better. John. Toward the end of the week, Mary was very run down. Most nights we were up listening to noises on the roof or smelling the odors the thing was pushing into the camper. It took its toll. There's no doubt about that. Don came to her mother one day and said, Grandma's crying, Mom. You'd better go help her. Janet found Mary Smurl in the camper, weeping. Janet. You could see the effects the whole week had had on her. Her health wasn't strong to begin with, and this week had just about shattered her. The weather wasn't helping either. It was difficult to enjoy a week in the outdoors when a steady drizzle fell much of the time or when the temperature slipped as low as 50 degrees. There were two nights remaining on their planned outing. <sighs> Janet asked Jack if he wanted to return to West Pittston. Want to be like admitting defeat? <laughs> Janet sighed, forced to agree with him. That night Scott Bloom and Dawn heard a terrible moaning sound. Dawn. It was like something from the grave. It really was. Jack woke just as the moaning was subsiding. He got his flashlight and walked around the camper, but another long pause. It is obvious to the interviewer that Mary is gathering her strength. She has begun to fidget. The demon attacked my bed in the camper. Would you describe that for us, please? The bed is nailed to the floor. There is no way you can move it. That first night, it was just after midnight. I was asleep in the camper when I heard very hard and rapid rappings on the roof and floor. I started to get up out of my bed, but before I could, I felt the whole bed being ripped from the floor, jerked to the left and then jerked to the right. You could hear the nails tearing at the floor. Did anybody come to help you? I screamed, of course, but one thing about the demon is its speed. The whole incident was over before anybody could reach me. It just stopped. It just stopped. Mary's fragile health is never more apparent than during this interview. As she speaks, her eyes take on a curiously luminous quality, and whatever anger she might have for the demon is dissipated by sheer physical weariness. What were your feelings then, Mary, about the whole situation? Long pause. It was becoming obvious that not only could the demon follow us, but it could pretty much do what it wanted to. How did the week at the campground go from there? She looks at the interviewer and shakes her head. Her words are barely audible. From there it only got worse. Much worse. But hadn't things like this happened when Janet and Jack had visited the campground Mrs. before? Mrs. Girl, and get back to you tomorrow. Yes. How would that be? That would but be what was supposed to be special about this trip that was, was that both families had left the entire house vacant. In a very real sense, we had turned over the house to the demon as a kind of sacrifice. We wanted to see if it would respond by leaving us alone at the campground. So if it had left you alone, then we'd realize that what it wanted was something in the house itself, and we'd all vacate. We'd do what Janet had said. We'll rent it if we have to, but we'd move right away, and we'd stay together no matter what. So when the demon tried to tear your bed from the floor, what was the reaction? Well, the first thing was, of course, that 
Everybody was very frightened for me. What did they feel about the demon in general? Well, even though we all agreed it was too soon to tell how the week would go for sure, we had a pretty good suspicion, I'm afraid, of what lay ahead for us. It turned out to be a terrible week. Had Scott Bloom along because... But then, we'd had high hopes that it would be a real vacation. A troubling realization. The time was 3 a.m., the third day of the camping trip. Jack lay awake, still thinking about the incident that had taken place around midnight, when he'd gotten up in response to a shout from his father from a sleeping berth near the front of the camper. I couldn't believe it, John Smurl had anxiously told his son. I felt the whole mattress being lifted up from under me. I was afraid it was going to throw me into the wall. Then I looked out the window. John Smurl had shaken his head, exhausted from his encounter with the supernatural. I saw this white form appear outside the window. I'd have to say it was dressed in chiffon, and it stayed there a moment and then just walked away. Just like that. Jack had embraced his father to keep the older man from trembling. A rage rose in Jack, one he knew well by now, one he had no idea what to do about. So now it was 3 a.m., and he lay awake. By now, the fourth day of their camp sojourn just ahead of him, he knew the answer to the question he'd come here to find out. Wherever Jack Smurl went, the entity was going to follow. There in the darkness, moonlight casting long shadows through the camper windows, the scent of wood smoke from the campfire outside pleasant on the air, there in the darkness, the entity responded to Jack Smurl's bitterness. The sound of animal hooves striking the metal roof penetrated the darkness like gunfire. Jack sat upright, bathed in sweat, and wanting to physically attack the unseen force that was tormenting him. He rushed over to the center of the camper to where the holy water was kept. Armed with a vial of the sacred fluid, he stood up and began sprinkling the water across the ceiling. As he did so, he let his eyes rove out to the campsite to the guttering fire and the leafy summer oaks encircling them. Sitting on a picnic table bench, looking calm and peaceful like a contented picnicker, was the faceless, cloaked black form that Jack knew to be the demon itself. An anger he'd never known before, a blinding anger that turned him into a being that was as much animal as man, overtook Jack and he smashed into the camper door so hard he nearly took it off its hinges. Janet came wide awake and jumped up to grab onto her husband. She'd never seen him this furious before. A glance out the window told her why he was so enraged. The black form had followed them. All she could understand at this moment was that she had to stop Jack from confronting the black form. Jack slammed open the door and started down the steps. No, Janet cried. You don't know what it will do to you. But Jack seemed not to hear her. His eyes were fixed on the transparent black form sitting on the bench, flames from the guttering fire casting an eerie red glow over its demonic body. In Jack's hand, Janet realized for the first time was a bottle, a weapon. No! She cried again and reached out for Jack, trying to stop him. But it was no use. Jack shrugged off her hands and walked, stalked, really, toward the demon which sat in plain sight as if it was waiting for Jack. Janet. Jack had just left the camper when it disappeared as it usually did. Just vanished. I can't tell you the relief I felt. I was so proud of my husband for wanting to defend us, but at the same time, I didn't want to see him hurt. I knew that his anger was just giving the demon a perfect excuse to murder him. And that's what I was praying against. The remaining days of the camping trip went no better. John... Toward the end of the week, Mary was very run down. Most nights we were up listening to noises on the roof or smelling the odors the thing was pushing into the camper. It took its toll. There's no doubt about that. Dawn came to her mother one day and said, Grandma's crying, Mom. You'd better go help her. Janet found Mary Smurl in the camper, weeping. Janet. You could see the effects the whole week had had on her. Her health wasn't strong to begin with, and this week had just about shattered her. 
The weather wasn't helping either. It was difficult to enjoy a week in the outdoors when a steady drizzle fell much of the time, or when the temperature slipped as low as 50 degrees. There were two nights remaining on their planned outing. Janet asked Jack if he wanted to return to West Pittston. Want to be like admitting defeat, honey? Janet sighed, forced to agree with him. That night Scott Bloom and Dawn heard a terrible moaning sound. Dawn. It was like something from the grave. It really was. Jack woke just as the moaning was subsiding. He got his flashlight and walked around the camper, but found nothing. When he returned to the camper, he found that his family had once more been wound tight to the point of breaking. At first light, Jack went to the manager of the campground and told the man that the family was headed back home. Day early, the man said. Jack frowned. That's been happening again. Earlier, Jack had confided in the man what had been taking place the past few years, including the supernatural incidents that had happened here at the campground. Jack had been afraid that the man would tell him that the Smurl family was not welcome here. Instead, the man had been very sympathetic, as he was now. Any way I could help. Jack smiled grimly. I sure wish there was. In the drizzle, the sky slate gray as in wintertime, the surrounding hills lost in a soft, silver mist, the Smurl family packed up its belongings. It had not been the trip they had hoped for. Jack fought against an anger that threatened to overwhelm him. He knew he needed to remain in control for the sake of his loved ones. On the way back home, Karen slept with her head in Janet's lap. When she woke up, Karen began crying very softly. Nobody had to ask why. Lorraine Warren Ed and I had been working on another case in upstate New York when the Smurls returned home and phoned us about their experiences at the campground. And the disturbances had only increased when they'd gotten home. The house filled with the smell of fecal matter when they first opened the door, and that was followed a few days later by an incident we had never encountered in all our years as psychic investigators. We got Janet to describe it in detail. Do you remember anything special about that morning? I was very, very tired. The trip to the campground had worn me out. This was a few days after our return, and I was still in bed at 10 in the morning, which was very unlikely. But for some reason, probably a combination of exhaustion and depression, I really couldn't drag myself out of bed. And that's when it happened. Can you describe it? I can try. It was a hand. A human hand. And it came from where? Right up through the mattress. A human hand. Right up through the mattress. While I was lying there. Did it try to choke you? No. It just grabbed me by the back of the neck and hey. held me. It felt like a human hand. No. Yes. It was very powerful. You could feel its muscles. Hot and sort of clammy, I guess, at the same time. Did you try to get away? I tried, but... It didn't do any good. You couldn't move. Right. We'll just have to wait for now. What did you do? It was very odd. I just sort of resigned myself. Always before I'd fought back, but after I realized I couldn't move, I thought, what's the use? Actually, I started talking to it. To the hand? Yes. And to the demon that controlled the hand. What did you say? I said... I don't care what you do to me. If you want to kill me, go ahead. I'm not going to fight back or anything. I'm starting to lose my will and maybe even my sanity, so... Why don't you just go ahead and get it over with? Take me right here and right now, but leave the rest of my family alone. Then what happened? The hand disappeared. Just like that. Just like that. Did the haunting subside for a while then? No. And that was when I realized that the demon took a great deal of pleasure in tormenting us. It enjoyed sapping our energy. In that sense, it was like a vampire needing blood. Only this demon needed our body heat and our spiritual energy 
and it enjoyed keeping us right on the edge all the time right on the edge hey. so the haunting continued just that night the banging in the walls started again and then the next day I saw Simon sort of mysteriously drawn to our upstairs closet where the demon liked to dwell. I barely got Simon back before he went inside. And then in the bedroom later on I heard these whispers that started to become moans. And I was... You were what? I was afraid I was losing my mind. The whispers, you mean? Everything. You really start to doubt your own sanity. Here, everything around you looks very familiar. Cars and appliances and groceries. Only there's something else, too. Some other dimension that other people don't have to endure. And when you're exposed to that dimension long enough, well, obviously it starts to take its toll on you and on everybody around you. All right. Jack got home that afternoon and I was really sobbing. I just mm. couldn't handle it anymore. He had to let me sit in his lap, as if I was a little girl. I really just couldn't deal with it. Come on, there was a part of me that wished the demon had taken me up on my offer. You know, that I could take my life if it would just leave my family alone. That way there would have been peace for everybody. That way the demon would have finally left us alone. I mean... We knew after staying at the campground for a week that there was going to be no peace for us. No matter where we went, it was going to follow us. No matter where we went. It even appeared to you and your mother, didn't it? Hey! Yes. Would you tell us about that? Gathers herself. Around 10 o'clock the following evening, my own mother, Gloria, came to visit. We sat in the kitchen and we saw this white, almost form appear on the other side of the screen door. It had the intensity of a fireworks display with a very, very white center. Gradually, we saw that the longer we stared at it, the more it resembled the black form that had appeared so many times before. Except this one was a white gold color. My mother held my hand the whole time. The form stood there, and when it vanished, she started crying. Yeah. I'd rarely seen her this upset. Ordinarily, she's a composed person, but then I realized how accustomed I was getting to supernatural phenomena, and I had to take into account that for other people, such events Thank were overwhelming. Much. I took my mother in my arms and held her for a very long time. For real? And then afterward, we sat back down at the table and had a very intimate conversation. The intense fear that we had shared had brought us even closer. Now then. I told her how much I loved her and cared about her. And she told me the same things. Now then. At the same time, the demon was working on John Smurl too, wasn't it? Oh, yes. The next morning, John was getting ready to go to work when he heard this voice say, don't I look sexy in bed? Congratulations. Now, you'd expect that the person speaking would be Mary, but of course it wasn't. Mary was asleep, and John knew it. He told me he stood there for maybe two minutes, almost afraid to turn around. Afraid of what he would see. But when he did turn around, there was nothing. Just empty space. Again. The demon had begun imitating family voices. I knew you could do it. The demon also created a terrible new way to terrorize you, too. Didn't it? Yes. Striking in two places at once. All right. While Kim was in the bathroom nice. with Simon, it started whispering to Simon and Kim, heard it, and at the exact same time, on the other side of the duplex, it appeared to Mary in the form of a very grotesque dog that scooted under her couch. It showed itself to Shannon, too. Shannon was asleep during a very bad electric storm, and when she woke up, she saw a white form, much like the one my mother and I had seen with very big black eyes, as she described them to us. The demon was active later that night also, picking on Simon again. It 
pretended to be a cat, and from inside the closet came the sounds of a cat meowing. Simon rushed to the closet door. Leah opened it up for him to see if in fact he had a new playmate, but it was just the demon playing tricks again. Actually, if you could have seen the disappointment on Simon's face when he found out there wasn't anything in there, well, that was pretty funny. Unfortunately for Janet and Jack, Simon's sad face would be about the only laugh the family would enjoy for many long days afterward. All right. People are talking. Tuesday of that week, there was a phone call from the producer of the TV show, People Are Talking, inviting the Smurls to return, but Janet gently declined. Though there was increasing talk of going public, no final decision had been made. Besides, as Janet joked to Jack that night, people are talking anyway, whether we go on that show or not. The Smurls were well aware of how many people in West Pittston were talking about their problems. Friends told other friends, and soon the awareness <laughs> level was very high. Sometimes when the demon was not making her life miserable, Janet liked to sit in the front window and stare out at the children playing in the street. At these moments, she knew a peace that was rarely hers these days, the peace of being a link in a vast chain. Her mother had been a link, and now she, as a mother, was a link. And someday, the four girls would be links. She watched as Karen jumped rope and sang London Bridge. Janet wondered for how many decades, or perhaps even centuries, children had been singing London Bridge. And she delighted herself for the next 20 minutes, watching how the sun dappled the pavement and the grass and the shrubbery. This was August, and you could see the first hints of autumn in the brown turning hills in the distance. The air was hot, but not too much so, and Janet, her head on the couch, allowed herself the luxury of drifting off to sleep until the screams from upstairs jarred her from her slumber. She went up the stairs two at a time. Shannon had not been feeling well and had come in for a nap. When she reached Shannon's room, out of breath and terrified, Janet saw Shannon huddled in a corner, big tears streaking her cheeks. A man, Mommy, Shannon said. What man? He came into the room and started taking things out of my toy box. Janet went over and knelt next to her daughter, smoothed her hair, kissed her wet cheek. Honey, maybe you were dreaming it. I wasn't asleep, Mommy. I was playing. Anyway, he's come in here before. He has? Shannon nodded somberly. Can you describe yeah. this man for me, honey? He's big, and he walks sort of funny, and his eyes are real dark, and it, it hurts to look at him. And he smells. He smells real bad. Has he tried to hurt you in any way? He just looks at me, Mommy. She put her head on Janet's shoulder and began crying softly. He scares me, Mommy. He scares me a lot. <gasps> Going public. By the time Jack got home that evening, Janet was on one of her half and half diets. Half nicotine, half caffeine. As he stood in the kitchen doorway, observing how tightly wound his wife was, Jack sensed that she was approaching another crisis point. She turned from the window, and there were tears in her eyes. It was in Shannon's room again this afternoon, she said. Jack swore, very quietly. She said, it's time. He did not have to ask what she was talking about. What if they laugh? Then they laugh, Jack said. What if they call us crazy? Then they call us crazy. What if they laugh at the children? The pain in his eyes was more than she could stand to look at. She dropped her gaze. I'm sorry I said that. No, he said. No, you're right. Maybe they will laugh at the kids. That would be hard to stand. But you know what would be even harder? What? To watch it destroy us, one by one, and not to fight back every way we can. He touched her hand. The evening shadows were purple in the kitchen window. The stars were bright in the hazy wash of sky. And that means exposing it. 
That means forcing the diocese to get involved, and that means letting everybody in the community know what's going on here. Even if some people do laugh at us. He paused. You agree? She did not give her answer for a very long time. And when it came, it was not even a word. Welcome. It was just a nod. A simple but profound nod. Oh. Lull before the storm. Nice. They sat up long into the night, making plans. In the morning, Janet would once again try the diocese. And then she would, if the diocese office refused to help, call a staff writer for the Wilkes-Barre Sunday Independent named Sandy Underwood. In the morning, following a night without any evidence of the demon, Janet rolled over and slid her arm around her husband's side. This is sort of like the old days, she said sentimentally. He said, then she nudged him and laughed. No, hurry. She jumped out of bed and said, Remember how we used to like to stay in bed to the very last minute? And then we'd have to rush around? Well, I guess what time it is. Jack rolled over and glanced at the clock. He had 45 minutes to get to work. Uh, I really overslept. He kept asking me to hit the snooze alarm. He kissed her, laughed, <laughs> raised. Then the laugh faded. You remember everything you're supposed to do? Right. I sure hope the diocese just decides to go along and we don't have to go to the paper. Stubbornly, Janet said, I guess that'll be up to them. He kissed her again and said, Good luck, honey. I sure hope it works. While Jack showered, Janet threw on a robe and went downstairs to fix his breakfast. Janet Smurl here recounts her experience with the diocese office. You phoned the office? Yes. And what were you told? Basically, that they would do something to help us. Did they define what that something was? They certainly gave the impression that it would be something along the lines of sending a priest down. So you didn't call the newspaper that day? No. Did a priest come out? No. Did you call the diocese back? We talked about it, but then we began to think, what's the use? All your life you're raised to believe in the kindness of the church, and then you go through something like this. Well, it just drains you. That's the only way to put it. You go to shoot it drains you. I heard things so eventually, you did go to the press. Not eventually, a few days later. And you went because the church didn't offer its help. That and because of what happened to Jack. And that was... A succubus appeared for a second time. Almost exactly one year after it attacked the first time. Like I said, it was devastating. If you're busy, I'll put my number in your phone so you can call me later. Sound a second like attack. Fine? Stop it. The time was dawn. A round red summer sun was pushing up past clouds already hazy with pollutants, casting want? an almost bloody glow over the bedroom in which Janet and Jack Smurl slept. And then, abruptly, Jack was awake. I'm just being friendly here. A blustered young woman was on top of Jack, riding him in the position of sexual domination. Despite her beauty and the pleasure, she was obvious. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for the trouble. Something? 
So, what made you step in to help me? Well, I apologize for asking something so strange. You're headed to the cleanup as well, right? The Sleep joined. Her eyes remained a shocking and sickly oh, neon green. Time. Next to I'm him, so sorry. Janet slept. I haven't even thanked you properly Jack yet. knew that she was in oh, a no. deep psychic I forgot my sleep. Gym at school. Despite I'll his prayers, the succubus soon. would we not be contained. Then, if you like. Still in the form of the beautiful young woman whose alabaster nakedness was only complemented by the reddish glow mean? of the rising sun, the succubus plundered Jack sexually, sinking down and then moving up on him several times. He exhorted the demon to be gone, but he found that he was unable to move or speak. And the succubus continued, mounting him once more, hair flying wildly, neon green eyes growing larger and more lurid as its mouth ran with the drool of satisfaction. The curious thing was that for all the movement, and the succubus put on a dazzling show full of tricks, Jack felt no sexual sensation at all. He lay there and simply watched the demon perform. And it was over. One moment he had been the lawn of Satan himself, and now he lay covered with a gelatinous, sticky mess. The same stuff the night hag had left on him when it had reached a climax during its first attack. Sickened by what had happened, Jack got up from the bed and went into the shower where he stood for nearly half an hour. He scrubbed himself until his skin ached. Out of the shower, he covered himself with talcum powder and aqua velvet. Then he began brushing his teeth, obsessively, to the point that his gums began to bleed. In those clothes? Oh, no, I'm in a different... The interview. There you are, Dr. Maroki. Following the reappearance of the succubus, Jack Smurl went down to the breakfast table and quietly said, I'd like you to call that reporter, Sandy Underwood, this morning. See you all later. And so it was arranged. What they put off for so long, what appeared to be the only thing left for the Smurls, going public and putting themselves at the mercy of the public and the media. Janet, you always hear that confession is good for the soul. And then you reach a catharsis when you tell somebody something that has been troubling you a long time. But in this case, in the case of the interview, I mean, we were just kind of going through the motions. Sandy was very nice. She took us seriously and asked very intelligent follow-up questions and gave us plenty of time to clarify what we said. Jack and Lorraine backed up everything we said. They were very helpful to us, very helpful. And I have to smile when I think back to some of Sandy's expressions. We gave her a lot of material, really? probably a lot more than she thought she'd get. And Ed and Lorraine gave her a very good grounding in the whole psychic experience. Janet, I was surprised by how sympathetic and attentive to details she was. She really wasn't just looking for a sensational story. She wanted the truth to be told, and she was willing to let us tell it our way. And so we did. We covered most of the high points of the infestation since the beginning. Jack. Is he that there was an inherent story? plea in the yeah. story for anybody who could help us to please step leaders? forward and do Keep so. We also Keep made a very Jesus. strong appeal for the diocese to get involved again. Ugh. Janet, Anyone who just I suppose we had mixed girl feelings girl when like it was all over. As if we didn't know quite how to feel. Oh, On the one hand, it, it did feel sure good to just the tell the facts as they happened and so use our real name and address. That was one reason we decided to go with the newspaper instead of TV. We felt it would give us an opportunity to be more cautious and to make sure that what we said was what we wanted to say. When you get in front of a camera, you just can't believe the pressure that's on you. Jack, after the interview was finished, we sat with the Warrens and talked about what we might anticipate from the public. And we seemed to swing from optimism to pessimism. 
That kept like reminding us that the public could be fickle Wait, and unpredictable. Sure that but that the box? thing we had to keep our eye on was that we'd come clean, what? as it were. Was that and that we should feel better about that. And I guess yeah, we did, really. There had been a cleansing effect in telling our story. Kids. It's Janet, be the, work of some the story was due to come too. out on Sunday, August 17th. All we could do at this yeah, point was wait model? and see what the reaction oh. was. Sure. As Jack said, we'd have these great oh, highs and great collector? lows trying to figure out how people were going to react exactly. to us. Recycling Jack, companies collect we decided to go away for the weekend, the to Cinnamon Sun, to visit my sister and her husband, Cindy and James Coleman. Well, that sounds like the awesome demon, to, to remind us that nothing had changed world. where it was concerned, woke I'm me up sorry, in the middle of the night with I'm a burning sure smell. I checked the Coleman house and found no fire or anything. Finally, I went back to bed. There was some hanging, just enough to annoy me, but eventually I got to sleep. Overall, we had a very nice weekend. Mom and Dad joining us for their 49th wedding anniversary. The wood burning smell came one more time, and I checked it out. Remembering that the Warrens had said that if we smell fire, we should check it out because this smell is often created by demons and. While it's usually manufactured, there is the dim possibility that one time in a million, it might actually be a fire. But it wasn't, so we went back to enjoying our weekend. Janet, 49 years of marriage is really something to celebrate, and we did. It was one of the loveliest weekends we've ever had. None of us said much about the newspaper article that was going to appear. We just decided to wait till we got back home know, to see what happened. It, We'd know soon it enough. Was a crappy time out there. On the drive back home, the windows oh. rolled down in the van. The rolling I green countryside, serene at dusk. You, Janet so said, you wouldn't it be nice if we found somebody waiting on our doorstep who told us exactly so what to do to get rid of the people in your group, Jack laughed and patted her knee. You don't want much, do you? Uh, I see. I'm in no pretty much the same situation. If Understanding, you, compassion, a together. solution to their dilemma. These were the things the Smurls had hoped that publicity would bring them. In fact, it what? brought them just the opposite. On the Sunday night when they returned from John's and Mary's anniversary Thanks celebration, the they sensed an uneasiness in the neighborhood. Two of the you girls remarked on this fact. This morning. Something was feels weird, huh? Don said as the family unloaded so things I from the really camper and brought them inside the house. Thank you so oh, much. it's just your imagination, huh? Janet said, not wanting to admit that she felt the same inexplicable anxiety. Sorry, Washing up 20 minutes later, There's Janet happened to glance out the window. Immediately, she called for Jack. I'm also so Her husband, sorry, always alert to trouble, appeared almost instantly. Everything all right? He asked. Look outside. Jack walked over to the window and parted the frilly blue chintz curtains. The, the car, we just had Janet had. said. The black guns? In the school yes. You get involved with. What about it? This it's been the sitting there for ten places. minutes. Wonder why. Oh, 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 There's three the of them. The so three of who? Teenage boys? Two in the front seat and one in the back. Mr. And they Kamushita take turns pointing to our house. Prior, so An unpleasant awareness dawned in Jack. I heard some of my the article this morning. About you too. Right. My God. Our house, Janet said, is going to become a tourist attraction. Janet's prediction came true. In the course no, of the next week, the Smurl family logged more than 200 like calls from journalists of and every stripe. Newspapers, television, you, both local and national, radio, like both local and national, wire services, and supermarket tablets. And the true, three though. teenage boys we sitting in a black heard. Dodge pointing we're to the house proved to be only the start. Day and night, cars filled with gawking, pointing people crawled past the duplex. Some of the faces reflected the gravity of the Smurl situation. Others smirked and forced off. The street itself was beginning to resemble the parking lot of a major public event. The event being housed inside the Smurl duplex. By Friday, those who merely drove by and pointed had been replaced by a more brazen breed of onlooker. These people brought beer, soda, and sandwiches and camped out on the sidewalk or on the neighbor's front lawn. Some even climbed a tree in front of the house and tried to get onto the porch to take a look inside the house from the upstairs windows. A policeman told a local reporter, This is like a mixture of a rock concert and a religious event. You've got people out here purely as a lark, but... You've also got people who are screaming and passing out and claiming that they see all sorts of sights inside the Smurl house. There are some pretty scary people here, and that's why I feel sorry for the Smurls. This is the kind of crowd that can turn ugly, 
very quickly huh? with just the right incentive. I guess you 24 hours a day, the spectators continued to move past the duplex. The they came in shiny new Buick in rusted old Plymouths, in sporty little Toyota trucks, and on sleek black Harley Davidson there? motorcycles. Oh, it was some just pointed, some, basic some smirked, some blessed themselves. They were young and old, white and black, rich and poor. Joke. Some of them went around the block many times, and some found a place from which they could sit or stand in the baking heat and observe the house. West Pittston had never seen anything like this. As one town official told a network television reporter, this is the largest private event in West Pittston's history. By Thursday of this week, more than 1,600 cars drove past the small household every day. But that was only the beginning. Cars and campers from virtually every state in the Union have been parking all over West Pittston, and their owners have walked over to the Smurl House. There have even been fights among the onlookers to see who got closest to the house. It's been a total zoo, so much so that on Thursday night we ordered the police to barricade the entire street and got that back. Among the thousands who had thronged to the duplex on West Pittston were teenagers who hurled beer bottles at the house and called out Personally, filthy names. A motorcycle gang with occult so symbols on their jackets and from menace from in their eyes. And some college students who thought it was funny to really walk by with big ghetto blaster radios and play Ghostbusters. But this wasn't the only attention. The pleasant awareness dawned in Jack. The article this morning. Right. My God. Our house, Janet yes, said, sir. is going to become That's a tourist right. attraction. But I promise, I'll go Janet's prediction came true. In the course of the next week, the Smurl family logged more than 200 calls from journalists of every stripe. Newspapers, television, both local and national. Radio, both local and national. Wire services and supermarket tabloids. And the three teenage boys, sitting in a black Dodge, pointing to the house, proved to be only the start. I've Day and night, the cars filled with gawking, pointing people crawled past the duplex. The average person. Some of the faces reflected the gravity of the Smurl's situation. Others well. smirked or scoffed. Wouldn't a natural the street itself was beginning to resemble the parking lot of a major public event. The event being housed inside the Smurl duplex. Well, by Friday, those who merely drove by and pointed had been replaced by a more brazen breed of onlooker. These people brought beers, soda, and sandwiches and camped out on the sidewalk or on the neighbor's front lawn. Some even climbed a tree in front of the house and tried to get onto the porch to take a look inside the house from the upstairs windows. A policeman told a local reporter, This is like a mixture of a rock concert and a religious event. You've got people out here purely as a lark, but you've also got people who are screaming and passing out and claiming that they see all sorts of sights inside the small house. There are some pretty scary people here, and that's why I feel sorry for the small. This is the kind of crowd that can turn ugly very quickly with just the right incentive. 24 hours a day. They came in shiny new Buicks and rusted old Plymouths, in sporty little Toyota trucks and on sleek black Harley Davidson motorcycles. Some pointed, some smirked, some blessed themselves. They were young and old, white and black, rich and poor. Some of them went around the block many times, and some found a place from which they could sit or stand in the basic heat and observe the house. West Pittston had never seen anything like this. As one town official told a network television reporter, this is the largest private event in West Pittston's no, history. No. By Thursday of this week, more than 1,600 cars drove past the small household every day. But that was only the beginning. Cars and campers from virtually every state in the Union have been parking all over West Pittston, and their owners have walked over to the small house. There have even been fights among the onlookers to see who got closest to the house. It's been a total zoo. So much so that on Thursday night, we ordered the police to barricade the entire street. It got that bad. Among the thousands who had thronged to the duplex of West Pittston were teenagers who hurled beer bottles at the house and called out filthy names. A motorcycle gang with occult symbols on their jackets and menace in their eyes. And some college students who thought it was funny to walk by with big ghetto blaster radios and play Ghostbusters. But... This wasn't the only attention the family was attracting. Room, huh? By now, Janet and Jack Smurl had become instant celebrities. 
Throughout the United States, major daily newspapers carried their story and their photo. What kind of kid are you? From the New York the Post to national television news shows, the Smurls have become a major story. Of those reporters invited into the Smurl home, two reported supernatural experiences of their own while inside the house, which only heightened the impact of their stories. One complained of bitterly freezing temperatures and another of a sickening right. fetid odor. It didn't take long for reporters to understand that what was going okay. on here was both serious um, and real. By week's end, even more reporters time. had joined the fray and were turning out it's Smurl copy. As Janet Smurl would remark this? later, However, we've actually paid two prices, the haunting itself and the loss of our privacy. I can't tell what that first week was like. We were literally prisoners inside our own house. And some of the reporters were very insulting, questioning not just our motives, but our sanity. It only increased the stress. Fortunately, we did meet a few good people. Among them, a woman named Megan Cosgrove. Ed Warren. Over the years, Lorraine and I had seen many supernatural events turn into media events. Most notably, the Brookfield, Connecticut case with its resulted in murder trial. But we had seen none that had attracted such sheer frenzy. Janet and Jack met both types of reporters, the good and the bad. The former was sympathetic, methodical, open-minded. The latter, one of the most sensational story they could get, even if it presented the squirrels in a bad light. Just as the more cynical reporters depressed Janet and Jack, so did the crowd. There was an ugly aspect to it all. The sun beating down, a sense of madness in the eyes of the hot, sweaty gawkers, and even contempt in some of their voices. As if they were demanding that the Smurls prove to them that satanic forces were in fact at work here. Lorraine and I even had words with some of the spectators. We made the mistake of simply asking a few of the bushier ones to move off the lawn and let the family have its privacy. Some of them, soaked with sweat, smelling of beer, challenged our right to make our request. It was at this moment that I saw how the demon was turning all this into yet another form of punishment for the smart. Looking out your window to find a stranger peering in is a very unnerving experience, and one the Smurls would suffer for months. Fortunately, among the vast media audience was a 38-year-old woman named Megan Cosgrove, who happened to work at the same plant where Jack did. It was she who contacted the Smurls and told them of a remarkable woman who communicated frequently with the supernatural world through a spirit she could contact at will. The woman's name was Betty Ann Moore, and she came over to the Smurl house on Thursday, August 21st. The upshot was stunning and provided a key clue to our ongoing investigation. Janet. Megan was very impressive, Bye. warm but businesslike. Shortly after she sat down on the couch, we saw her give a start. I asked her what was wrong and Megan said that something sharp but invisible had poked her in the eye, like a human thumb. Morning. And then, as she was wiping the tears from her eyes, her head jerked up and she pointed to something by the staircase. We asked her what it was, and she then proceeded to describe perfectly the black form that had haunted us for nearly two years. Her eye continued to swell. Finally, she had to go home and put an ice pack on it. She returned later that night with Betty Ann Moore, who had a very serious aura about her. We could see that she was very aware of what was going on here and was also very concerned. She asked to be taken through all the rooms in the house and then down into the basement which was where she came into contact with a spirit named Abigail. Betty Ann was in a state of trance, her eyes closed and her fingers trembling. She said, Abigail is elderly, and she's either senile or confused, but she isn't harmful. Then Betty Ann went on to describe Abigail in exactly the same terms Lorraine had months earlier. Twenty minutes later, when Betty Ann asked to be taken to the middle bedroom upstairs, we saw how exactly her sense of the haunting matched Lorraine's. Because Betty Ann then started to describe another spirit she was seeing. A man with a mustache named Patrick. Who she said had died here but was afraid to return to the other side. Betty Ann lost in another trance, then began to give us some background on Patrick. He was a man who often beat his wife, Elizabeth, somewhere near the Smurl property before the house was built. This was sometime in the 19th century. Whenever Elizabeth became afraid of Patrick, 
she became involved with another man. One day Patrick came home unexpectedly and found Elizabeth in the embrace of her lover. He killed both of them, strangling Elizabeth and beating the man to death with his fists. Betty Ann then described how Patrick was beaten by a mob and then hung for the murders. And then she turned to me and said something we have never expected. Janet, you look like Elizabeth. Patrick thinks Jack is your lover and he wants you and Jack separated. As she told us this, a vase began to rattle and then sharp rappings were heard in the wall. Betty Ann in a strange, deep voice began to implore Patrick to go to the other side. But she told us that he was afraid he'd be punished if he crossed into the other realm. When Betty Ann came out of her trance, she said very matter-of-factly, Patrick doesn't want to leave this house. It will be very difficult to get rid of him. Then Betty Ann paused, looking very distressed, and said, But that isn't the worst news. There's more, I'm afraid. She shook her head almost as if she were afraid to give voice to what she was thinking. What? There's a third earthbound spirit here. It could be either a man or a woman, I'm not sure. But whatever it is, it's violent and vicious and means to harm you. She then explained that this spirit was insane and if it were alive today would be institutionalized in a mental hospital. This is the malevolent spirit that controls Patrick and continues to urge him to do violence. This is the spirit that wants the demon to commit the ultimate atrocity, possession of one or both of you. Her eyes stared at midpoint in the room, and her voice became even huskier. Then, there is the demon itself, a direct disciple of the devil. I sense it throughout the house, everywhere. The look that passed between Janet named Abigail. Betty Ann was in a state of trance, her eyes closed and her fingers trembling. She said, yeah. Abigail is elderly, and she's either senile or confused, but she isn't harmful. Then Betty Ann went on to describe Abigail in exactly the same terms Lorraine had months earlier. Twenty minutes later, when Betty Ann asked to be taken to the middle bedroom upstairs, we saw how exactly her sense of the haunting matched Lorraine's. Because Betty Ann then started to describe another spirit she was seeing. A man with a mustache, named Patrick. Who she said had died here but was afraid to return to the other side. Betty Ann lost in another trance, then began to give us some background on Patrick. He was a man who often beat his wife, Elizabeth, somewhere near the Smurl property before the house was built. This was sometime in the 19th century. Whenever Elizabeth became afraid of Patrick, she became involved with another man. One day Patrick came home unexpectedly and found Elizabeth in the embrace of her lover. He killed both of them, strangling Elizabeth and beating the man to death with his fists. Let's go. Betty Ann then described how Patrick was beaten by a mob and then hung for the murders. And then she turned to me and said something we'd never expected. Janet, you look like Elizabeth. Patrick thinks Jack is your lover, and he wants you and Jack separated. As she told us this, a vase began to rattle, and then sharp rappings were heard in the wall. Betty Ann, in a strange, deep voice, began to implore Patrick to go to the other side. But she told us that he was afraid he'd be punished if he crossed into the other realm. When Betty Ann came out of her trance, she said very matter-of-factly, Patrick doesn't want to leave this house. It will be very difficult to get rid of him. Then Betty Ann paused, looking very distressed, and said, But that isn't the worst news. There's more, I'm afraid. She shook her head almost as if she were afraid to give voice to what she was thinking. There's a third earthbound spirit here. It could be either a man or a woman, I'm not sure. But whatever it is, it's violent and vicious and means to harm him. She then explained that this spirit was insane, and if it were alive today, it would be institutionalized in a mental hospital. This is the malevolent spirit that controls Patrick, and continues to urge him to do violence. This is the spirit that wants the demon to commit the ultimate atrocity, possession of one or both of you. 
Her eyes stared at midpoint in the room, and her voice became even huskier. Then, All right. there was so the demon itself, a direct disciple of the devil. I sensed it throughout the house, everywhere. The look that passed between Janet and Jack was heartbreaking, because once again the most disturbing possibility had been mentioned. The specter of possession, of a demon literally taking control of a living person. Would it be one of them? One of their children? No mercy. In the following two weeks, the Smurl family saw the human species by the house and offered them rosaries and other religious items. From all over the world came cards and letters wishing them well, and including special prayers and suggestions about how to handle their haunting. Clergymen of every denomination contacted them and offered them prayers, all except, for the present anyway, a representative of the diocese, Jack. One thing that was reassuring about the mail was that we heard from so many people who had had experiences similar to ours. And I mean people from everywhere, Brazil, Puerto Rico, the Netherlands, and many other European countries. Janet, there was no rest for us. During this time when the press surrounded our house, the haunting continued, usually in the form of rappings or the free appearance of the dark form, or down on our kitchen table the telegrams and messages stacked up. We put them in grocery bags and in boxes, and piled them in the kitchen closet. We just kept running out of room. Fortunately, since most of the messages contained information and good wishes and religious medals, they were encouraging rather than discouraging. But certainly, there were things to be discouraged about. Even on Friday, August 22nd, when West Pittston recorded a significant amount of rainfall, the crowds were merciless, pushing closer, closer, trying for a look inside or to touch family members as they tried to leave the house. Jack. Some people were convinced we were holy, and other people were convinced we were messengers from Satan. The latter got very bad when we heard from a coven of witches who wanted to come over and meet us. That's just what we needed at that time. Witches. Somewhere. The people on the street began to display even more bizarre behavior. Janet. Two incidents really disturbed us. One morning a man holding a handgun drove past our house very slowly. We happened to be looking out the window at the time and we ducked down, afraid of what he might do. Another man got very close to our front door with a huge machete in his hand. Joker. Luckily several people have <coughs> shouted at him and he ran off. But of all the things that happened during the time of the crowds, probably the most depressing was the phone call from a woman I'd considered a friendly acquaintance, if not an outright friend of mine. Our daughters were in school together. School would start in a few weeks, but she called me one evening and said that she didn't want her daughter to be friends with hey, mine anymore. That really hurt. Huh. What you got there? The reporters That's have really become neat. so overwhelming in their numbers and demands that on August 23rd at 2 p.m., Exactly. Wow. Janet and Jack stood amazing. on their back porch and read a prepared statement to the throng. Feeling strong, human as reporters, you can but see that this situation has gotten completely out of hand. Yes, no one is helping us with our problems. We can't keep up with all the calls and letters, and we don't know how to handle this situation. This, Please Jack. say a prayer for us in church. Here you go, mister. Temporarily, at least, the reporters now, pulled back from the house potential. and gave the Smurls some privacy. But that privacy was life. not to last okay. long. Learning about desires also teaches me more about humans. The haunting widens. The call came at dusk. Oh. The caller was a neighbor. She was not angry, but she was afraid. Very afraid. <laughs> Janet, it's affecting all of us, she said. I know. Janet said, fearing what her friend was going to say next. Six separate houses, including mine. Supernatural things, you mean? Speaking of... Wrappings, bad odors, screams. Doing good? I'm sorry. Janet said, feeling the last of her energy and hope draining from her. Now the demon was using their friends and neighbors to make the haunting even more terrible. The woman said, I didn't call to make you feel bad, Janet. I just wondered if there was any advice you could give us. Janet smiled bitterly to herself. 
If I had any to give, I would have taken it myself a long time ago. The woman laughed sadly. I guess that's right, isn't it? I'll pray for you, Janet said. That night watching TV, the Smurls saw something that surprised them. The anchorman on WNEP announced that the station had taken a poll to see how many viewers believed the Smurls' story and how many viewers disbelieved it. The results were amazing. 75% believed the Smurls and only 25% doubted them. Janet. I suppose it was silly to feel good about that, but after everything that had happened to us, it was nice to know that the majority of people in the community saw us as sane and honest. It was comforting to know that. In the middle of the night, Jack Smurl got up to go to the bathroom. Before going back to bed, he glanced at himself in the mirror. What he saw caused him to jerk backward, as if he'd been shot. The face in the mirror belonged not to him, but to a decomposed man whose flesh hung in tatters and whose eyes burned with the sorrow of the newly dead. Then the image was gone and his own face was back. For the remainder of the night, Jack lay in bed thinking of one word again and again. Possession. Is that what he would look like if the demon succeeded in completing the fourth stage of the haunting? Possession. He thought of what Betty Ann had described to him. He thought of what Ed and Lorraine Warren had said was the demon's ultimate goal. Then he thought of the ghoul he'd seen in the mirror. The feral, glistening eyes, the rotting flesh, the twisted skeletal hand. Had it been a premonition of what he okay. himself was about to become? Their life really was a long time coming. Lorraine Warren. At long last, Ed and I were glad to see that at least one goal of the Smurls going public had paid off. They heard from the diocese office, though unfortunately, not in the way they'd hoped. Janet told us, Father Doyle from the Diocese Bureau was not pleased that we'd given our story to the press. He said that we should have contacted the church first, as if we hadn't. We simply told him that, given all the things that were going on, we couldn't wait any longer, that our lives were now hanging in the balance. The Diocese Office was not pleased that they were getting so many calls from reporters asking about our case. I see the platform. Finally, a few days should after the call going? from Father Doyle, a priest came out and talked to us. We told him about the previous exorcisms and how the diocese had refused to help. We also expressed our resentment that a newspaper story the day before had given the impression that we'd never tried to contact the Scranton Diocese office until recently. He was very polite, but he was careful to express neither belief nor disbelief in what we told him. At the end of the interview, he was very cordial and said he'd get back to us. We did not hear from the Scranton Diocese for several days. Though meanwhile, a priest from another diocese offered to perform an exorcism. Then he called back and said that the Scranton office, which had heard of his offer, right. called him and said that for him to come into the Scranton diocese would break protocol. Wonderful. By this time, Ed and I had begun to chart the subtle but certain shift in ferocity the supernatural attacks displayed. We also noted Jack's somewhat different demeanor. Pale skin, anxious glances, and what appeared to be his clinical depression. This worried us greatly. We discussed this with Tammy Anderson, a team member of ours who was also a detective with the Bridgeport, Connecticut Police Department, and she went and visited the Smurls. She confirmed our fears about Jack's condition. Though we didn't use the word with Tammy, what we were concerned about was that the demon, which might well be jealous of Jack, seeing him as a rival for Janet's love, might in fact be in the process of trying to possess him. There was no doubt that drastic action had to be taken and quickly. We spent two long days brainstorming with team members. The result was a plan for a mass exorcism that would involve several priests. To tell the smells of our plan, Dr. Walter Hummel, a former medical examiner now in private practice, and his wife Sarah of Greenwich, Connecticut, went to the small duplex. Dr. Hummel, who has been our friend for more than 20 years and who has worked with us on many cases, reported back to us that he was quite moved by his interview with Janet and Jack, and that what made the situation so startling for him was that the haunting was not limited, as it usually was, to just a few people, but extended to dozens of people who were, in various respects, linked to the Smurls. While we were talking to the doctor and his wife, the phone rang. Ed answered it in the other room. When he came back, he looked upset. He said, 
I'm told the Scranton Diocese isn't going to help us with our mass exorcism. He didn't have to say any more than that. At the moment, that was about the worst news the Smurls could have received. The diocese declined. True to the priest's promise, the Scranton Diocese finally did call the Smurls back. Indeed, the office requested that Janet and Jack meet with Father Doyle in his own office the following afternoon. The Smurls were very hopeful that Father Doyle had good news for them, buoyed as they were by the fact that, as autumn began to touch the trees and thin the summer sunlight, the crowds camped outside had thinned somewhat. Not that the press itself had lost interest in the Smurl story. Jack, we were still on the news several times a week. And we lost count of how many hundreds of these stories have been filed about us. But happily, some of the freakish nature of the investigation had quieted down. With the call from the diocese, we had new hope that some serious steps were finally going to be taken, and that perhaps our problem would be resolved once and for all. 24 hours later, Janet and Jack sat in Father Doyle's office explaining the mass exorcism plan the Warrens had suggested. The Smurls were anxious for the diocese to talk to the Warrens. The Chancellor, also present at the meeting, stunned at the couple when he says that there was no reason whatsoever to talk to the Warrens, because from this point on, the diocese itself was taking over the investigation. But Ed and Lorraine have been a tremendous help to us, Janet said. But we haven't met anybody who understands the supernatural better than the Warrens. But the Chancellor shook his head. The diocese would be taking over the investigation. As far as the official church was concerned, the Warrens were no longer involved. Ed Warren. Lorraine and I were not surprised at the response of the church. Like all institutions, Catholicism has its own priorities, and obviously, in this case, the Chancellor felt that the most important thing to do was quiet the negative publicity over how the diocese office had treated the Smurls in the past. Our one reservation was that we knew how the church worked in such cases. The object being to find a scientific explanation for the hauntings whenever possible, sometimes to the exclusion of the real explanation. As for the Smurls, nothing got any easier for them. Interview with Aaron Turner. You've been a good friend of the Smurls. Very good. They're wonderful people. Would you tell us how you became involved in the haunting? I... It was because I telephoned Janet over a weekend. Could you explain? Well, they'd gone camping, which I hadn't known about, so I just kept calling to see if she yeah, wanted to get together and do some shopping. And weird suits. Would you elaborate on what oh, happened then? Think of this You're little the girl answered. Don't put little me girl. In the same boat as you. Yes. She sounded what? as if she was probably hey. seven or eight, and then she'd laugh. Laugh? That was the eeriest part, her laugh. She'd say, they don't live here anymore. And then she'd hang up. Oh. I called six or seven times that weekend. I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. But the little girl would always answer. Let's go. I even called the operator to verify the number, but she said that it was the Smurl house I was calling. Then you told Janet. Sure, right away. She oh, got as scared as I was. With everything her family was going through, they didn't need some new kind of trouble like this. Jack, despite the efforts of the church to carry on its own plans, Janet and I felt that it was important for us to carry on with ours. Namely, a prayer meeting organized by our friends, and by 50 women and 20 men of the Sacred Heart League of St. Mary's Annunciation in Kingston, which is near West Pittston. By the time these people and other family and friends filled the Smurl home, the mood was solemn. The days of the circus-like atmosphere of trust and publicity had faded. And now the Smurls were in a new era, trying to stop the demon from taking possession. The house was transformed. Vigil candles were set out every few feet in their lit, bathing the entire house in a shadowy glow as the voices of faithful rose in communal prayer, like the one the early Christians said in the catacombs. In some eyes you could see tears, on some lips smiles, because you had the sense that the devil was being driven out. At a gathering later on, two people even reported seeing an image of the Blessed Virgin somehow being projected onto one of the walls. A faint but perfect impression of the Holy Mother, bringing her own special powers to help drive out the demon. Janet, 
It was a very moving spectacle. All these concerned, caring people doing everything they could to help us. You could feel the love, you really could. I had tears in my eyes most of the time. And the house looked so beautiful with the vigil lights flashing different colors across everything. The faithful stayed till very late, but after several hours of calm and quiet, the television in the Smurl's bedroom began to rock from side to side, and pounding in the walls became so violent that Janet had to cover her ears. Sobbing, she said, Are they ever going to leave us alone? Ever? Ed Warren. Janet and Jack continued to call us frequently as we waited to see what the church would do. They also continued to hear from religious people from all over the world, some responsible and tender people, others strident and threatening. Finally, they even heard from the Scranton Diocese, which agreed to dispatch a priest in the person of Monsignor Joseph Brown. It would be the Monsignor's task to stay at the Smiles residence overnight and see if he could find any hard evidence of a true haunting. Though we said nothing at the time to Janet and Jack as they excitedly told us about this, we knew that the demon would probably choose not to expose itself, thereby making the Smurls appear to the priest as either frauds or hysterics. And that's what happened. Diocesan priests came to the Smurl house a few times, some to stay overnight while the family slept, but none heard or saw anything that endorsed the notion that a bona fide haunting was going on here. Jack, that was the irony. We'd struggled so long to get the church involved, but We'd never thought about it turning out this way. Here we made all these claims and the church couldn't anyway, find any proof to back them up. I can sense really Things were going so badly that Jack had lost 20 pounds since the family had gone public. Janet had not only lost weight, 14 pounds, she'd also developed an ulcer. One day as we were talking to Janet and Jack in their living room, I began to sense the presence of the demon itself. Once again, in a way I cannot articulate, I sensed that it had grown bolder and stronger and was ready to strike. Lorraine saw how upset I was, so. and as soon as we reached the van, she said, you look Joker, terrible. Just, uh, drive extra as soon as we get something. back, I'm going to call you Father McKenna. It can be hard to think. We rushed back to our home Somewhere. and got the priest on the phone. Ugly incident. As if to remind the Smurls that their enemies were not just of the supernatural variety, one night, they were sitting home watching TV when Jack heard a car slow down in front of the duplex. By now, of course, he'd gotten used to people cruising by in slow-moving cars. Even though public attention had dwindled, there was still a steady flow of the curious. Well, what is it, honey? Janet asked. Somebody parked out there. Circus time again, Janet said. But her gentle sarcasm ended abruptly when a beer bottle came hurtling through their front window. Jack. All the girls were crying and huddled in the corner. It was like there were two sieges going on, the demon and a few sick people who hated us for some inexplicable reason. I got a look at the people, they were teenagers. And I called the police, but the incident really left its mark on the family. It scared us and made us very angry all over again. And so we had to rely more than ever on Ed's and Lorraine's plan to try to end the infestation. I can't say we had much hope at that point, but Hope was about all we had. The final exorcism. Not even Father McKenna could summon many smiles on the day. A week later, when he drove back to the Smurl residence and performed the third exorcism. Early in the morning, just before driving over, Father McKenna had set a special mass for the Smurls, and so, that done, the exorcism consisted of saying special prayers on both sides of the duplex, and then going through each room with holy water. This time, the priest even blessed the backyard. Janet. Father McKenna's face was so beautiful. You could see the concentration on it. He was, in effect, putting his own soul on the line for this to work. There were no disruptions during this exorcism. So impassioned were Father McKenna's prayers that the demon seemed almost afraid to show itself. Finished, the priest once more started to his car, refusing the dinner the smells offered. Fasting was an integral part of the exorcism ritual, the priest reminded him. What followed was an almost daily pilgrimage to the Smurl residence, this time by friends and relatives of the Smurl family, okay. including the men of the Sacred Heart League. Prayers and vigil candles were strong on the air. 
It was Ed's and Lorraine's idea to drown the demon in prayer following the exorcism. Then it began to work. Jack. You could feel something. The way air changes after a storm has passed. At first, we were almost afraid to hope that the prayers and the vigil would help no, in any lasting way, but overall the days following the exorcism were great. We hadn't been that relaxed in over two years. The nice thing was, for the time being, there would be no surprises, at least not bad ones. Indeed, the one surprise the Smurls received in late September was a very pleasant one. Ed Warren. Janet called us a few minutes after she woke up. She won't believe it, she said to Lorraine and me. The whole house is filled with the scent of roses again. Even I had to take that as a good sign. And I say even I because experience has shown that it is sensible to be skeptical where hauntings are concerned. Under most circumstances, it takes a great deal of effort, either planned or inadvertent, to stir the demon, and then it is nearly impossible to get rid of it. Still, I had to admit that the extraordinary holiness shown by Father McKenna and the daily prayers taking place at the small house were apparently quelling the forces of darkness. And things only got better. Janet, we just couldn't believe it. Two, then three, then four weeks went by without a single incident. Every few days, the smell of roses would return to one or two of the rooms, and our house would be filled with the sound of prayer. It was wonderful, and you could see the wonder on the faces of our children. They started having friends over again, and planning parties, and you could hear their laughter all over the house. The press, of course, was still interested in what was going on at the small house and asked for a report. In a joint statement on October 28th, Janet and Jack Smurl announced, For several weeks now, all has been quiet in our house, and it would appear that our problem has been resolved. A spokesperson for the diocese said that after an intensive investigation, the diocese had reached no conclusions and had taken no position on the case, but that, since the Smurls said the matter had been resolved, the diocese was closing its inquiry. Gray November came, but for the Smurls, it had the feel of the most beautiful of springs, because in the walls there were no wrappings. On the air there was no grim slaughterhouse odor. On the faces of their children were the normal smiles of youth. Jack. We didn't quit praying, of course. If anything, we became even more religious. We didn't want our newfound freedom to be destroyed again. Joker! A treasure chest! Let's open it! The return. After Thanksgiving, the Smurl family began planning for Christmas. They had already been given the best gift of all, their peace of mind. But now they wanted to plan a holiday that would let them thank God and also celebrate their unity as a family. It was a good time for them. Janet and Jack began regaining some of their lost weight, and they both eased into spending even more time with the girls and school activities. No, you couldn't ask for a better time than this. Jack enjoyed resting in his favorite chair, sometimes watching TV and goes off, especially following a hard day's work. Tonight, he'd done exactly that. Plus, for perhaps half an hour. Now he was awake again. Johnny Carson was on. The monologue particularly funny tonight. Jack decided watching Carson would be a good way to get completely relaxed before going upstairs to bed. With the holidays less than two weeks away, the living room was aglow with lights from the Christmas tree. Beautiful, soft greens and yellows and reds. The air was scented with the clean tang of the fir tree itself. Then he clicked off the TV and began to pray. As he did so, he glanced up at the mirror over the sofa, and he saw it, the black, caped form whose presence had announced the haunting to begin with. Only this time there was a difference. Jack sensed the demon beckoning to him, summoning him, really, and he knew instantly what this signified. The final, dread stage of a haunting. Possession. He bolted from the chair, keeping his rosary tight in his hand. The black figure started toward him. Jack scrambled to the stairs and started backing up them slowly so he could keep the demon in his sight. The black figure grew even closer. Jack's heart hammered. He was drenched in sweat. Twice he stumbled and desperately clutched at the banister for support. The caked figure continued to move closer. Closer. Then Jack, sensing that the demon would lunge at him, took his rosary and showed it to the creature. He also began to say over and over the prayer the Warrens had taught him. Only gradually did the demon withdraw. Jack's voice got louder and louder, his prayer more and more intense. 
Then before his eyes, the dark creature faded into the wall and disappeared. Jack determined not to mention this to his wife or the children. He wanted them to think that things were still fine, that the scent of roses would stay, and that life would be simple and good and normal. But in the middle of the night, bangings broke out in the walls, and on John and Mary's side of the duplex, the flooring trembled violently, as if an earthquake were taking place. The haunting had begun all over again. There could be no mistake about it. The demon and spirits had only been waiting for the opportunity to strike again and continue their unrelenting assault on the family. With their return, the entities used some new tactics. The flooring on John and Mary's side trembled violently, and when Mary was in the bathroom, a distorted white mass about three feet tall and covered with oozing pustules rushed past her and disappeared into the vanity. Over the next weeks, there was sharp decline in the health of the senior Smurls, and the Smurl children had slipped back into anxiety and depression. Every night now, the family was haunted. By New Year's Day, 1987, an atmosphere of terror once more filled the Smurl house. On January 10th, the girls went to bed early, and Janet and Jack soon followed. They had been asleep less than half an hour when the pounding began. If you listened carefully, you could hear not only the invisible fists of old, but strange new whispers and traces of laughter. Demonic laughter. Janet and Jack lay awake all night, holding hands and weeping. Ed and Lorraine Warren. Enemy ahead! Be careful! Today, the haunting continues. We wish we knew why. Even more, we wish we had a solution. Would a permanent move help the Smurls, perhaps? Will the haunting continue all their lives? Possibly. Will the family be able to withstand the stress? I could never we hope wear so. out in public, though. As demonologists, neither of us can ever recall the haunting of such tenacity. The demon simply will not be displaced. It has focused its very essence on the Smurl family and will not let go. We are still in contact with the Smurls, usually once a week. So is father, now Bishop McKenna. Occasionally, one of our research team has an idea, which we try, but to date, nothing has been successful. Hey, there is still, of course, a terrible prospect Whoa. of possession, but that is the ultimate goal of all hauntings. Jack in particular is well aware of this, for it is Jack whom the demon seems most Whoa. to despise. As for any closing words of optimism, we can only reflect on what Bishop McKenna has said. That the experience of the Smurls should erase any doubts non-believers might have that the spirit world exists. All you have to do is stand in the Smurl home to know that demons are a very real and very dangerous part of reality. The biggest gift we can offer the Smurls is our continued faith and our prayers that someday their burden will be lifted and the scent of roses will fill their home permanently. Ever since we started doing this sleeping through basically all my classes. Today. The Smurls live as quietly as possible, liked and admired for what they have endured, fearful that the haunting that has plagued them will never end. To be sure, there is laughter in the Smurl household. There is also pride and hope and real joy. No. But always in the corners of the night, there is the prospect that the demon will come and perhaps one day dominate their lives even more terribly. There is no doubt that their story is true. Too many witnesses and too much corroboration have supported their ominous tale. All that feeds their hope these days is that God in his kindness will end their ordeal. Soon. Postscript. Just as this book went to press, the small family moved from the Chase Street duplex. They now live in a quiet, nearby Pennsylvania suburban oh. community. The End We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged production of The Haunted, One Family's Nightmare by Ed and Lorraine Warren, Robert Kern, with Jack and Janet Smurl. Hey. Read for you by Todd Habercorn, produced by David Zendel. Text copyright night. Gray Malkin Media presents In a Dark Place by Ed and Lorraine Warren, Carmen Reed, and Al Snedeker with Ray Garden. Read for you by Todd Habercorn. 
These are the accounts of Ed and Lorraine Warren, the demonologists featured in The Conjuring films. Preface. Demonic Possession. The study of demonic possession never has been, is not now, and very likely never will be a science. There are, however, many who have devoted their lives to that study, who have tried to determine the point at which possession begins, so that it might be avoided. Possession goes back to the times of Christ, who cast demons from a number of people, according to the New Testament. Today, it is little more than a subject for Hollywood horror films. But many Christian churches and sects still practice the rite of exorcism, foremost among them being the Catholic Church. There are two different kinds of possession, that of a person and that of a place, such as a house or other kind of building. It is believed by many in the Catholic Church, however, that both come about in much the same way. First, there is the point at which the demon enters the person or the occupied building or house. There are a number of different theories as to what brings about the initial entry. In one well-documented case of demonic possession, the demon claimed to have chosen its victim before the victim's own birth. Some believe that even a passing interest in the occult can be an invitation to possession. Still, others think it will remain a mystery. That it is not for us to know until we face our Creator and hear the explanation firsthand. One thing is almost unanimously agreed upon, however. The initial entry is only made after the victim or the resident of the targeted building has made a choice, however subconscious, however tenuous, to allow it. For example, the Snedekers did nothing to bring on the possession of their house. That had begun long before. As Lorraine was able to sense clairvoyantly, something awful had taken place in that house sometime during its years as a funeral home. Someone had been using the dead bodies for their own sick pleasure, and it was that person's act of necrophilia that opened the door to possession. It was that person who made a choice, by indulging in such perverse activities, to give the forces of evil entry to that house long before the Snedekers ever moved in. Once the initial entry has taken place, the possessing entity gradually begins to break down its host or the occupants of the building it has entered. This is usually accomplished with fear. Not only does the possessing entity feed on fear, but it knows that fear will weaken its victim, thus bringing the entity closer to total control, closer to complete possession. In the case of the Snedekers, the forces in the house, determined to gain entry to the Snedekers themselves, used fear to weaken them. To try to turn them against one another, all the while waiting for the third stage of demonic possession. Weakened and vulnerable, confused and terrified, the victim inevitably reaches a turning point and surrenders voluntarily to the forces of darkness. An official exorcism cannot be held without proper investigation to determine whether or not the reported demonic activity is real. Sometimes a person with mental problems or a substance addiction or even a whole family suffering through domestic crises can take the smallest of coincidences and turn them into a series of frightening events that lead to the conclusion that the house is possessed by demons. Mental illnesses have been mistaken for possession throughout history. Illnesses such as schizophrenia, Tourette's syndrome, Huntington's chorea, Parkinson's disease, and even dyslexia. And even though medicine has advanced considerably over the years, such conditions must be ruled out by a priest before an exorcism is considered. A priest with a medical or other possibilities, then when satisfied, continues demonic presence. Once he is able to prove demonic activity to his satisfaction, the priest then approaches the church. After the case has been reviewed and found to be thorough, the decision is made to go through with an exorcism. According to those who have witnessed them, no two exorcisms are alike, although they all have two things in common, one of which is unforgettable to all those involved, whether it is an exorcism of a person or a building. Not terrible, the presence. but not impressive. It so is invisible, you'd like to ethereal. 
and yet felt so deeply by everyone involved that it seems and almost tangible. It is a presence neither male nor female. Neither human being nor animal. Neither a single entity nor a crowd of them. But it is distinct and, as the exorcism continues, it usually becomes stronger. Even when it speaks, it sometimes refers to itself as I, sometimes as we. It moves around those present like an ice-cold breeze, a draft from the depths of the deepest cave in the earth, until the exorcism is over. Until the possessing entity has been cast out in the name of God. Select the skills you'd like to The second thing all exorcisms have in common is the most threatening. Danger. Those participating in an exorcism are in constant danger and must anticipate hearing the foulest insults and seeing the most frightening things they are likely to experience in their lives. Their faith must remain rock solid in the face of horrible, supernatural abuse. Demons will not uproot themselves without a powerful fight, and their chief weapon, as always, is fear. They feed on it, and will do anything they can to wring it out of those involved in the attempt to cast them out. Not all such attempts are successful. Demons wait for an invitation before their entry. Do you really need this? But they don't always Select leave. Select the skills you'd like told. to inherit. One. It will receive Moving a in. Of <laughs> I see. Mom, we have to leave this house. There's something evil here. Carmen Snedeker stood at the kitchen sink with foamy suds clinging to her forearms and hands as she washed a plate. Wadded clumps of newspaper and empty cardboard boxes were scattered on the floor around her and Willie, the Snedeker's pet fairy, played among them. The dishes that, shortly before, had been wrapped in newspapers and packed in boxes were on the counter to Carmen's right, grimy with newsprint and dusty from travel. The laughing voices of the other children clattered off the bare walls as they ran in and out, breaking in their new home. She heard the thunking and shifting of heavy furniture being moved in by Al and his brother. Stephen, her 14-year-old son, had been wandering around the kitchen behind her, silent, restless, nudging boxes and papers with the toes of his sneakers, as if he had something to say, but didn't have the nerve. So she decided to wait until he was ready to speak. What'd you say, Stephen? Carmen asked as she rinsed the plate. He repeated himself. I said... There's something evil here, Mom. And we have to leave this house. Putting the plate on the drainer to her left, Carmen turned to Stephen slowly, frowning. Leave. Person. We just got here, honey. I know, but we've got to leave yeah. now. But where would we go? Back to New York. Back to our apartment. We have to, Mom. There's something... He stopped a moment and squinted slightly. As if he were selecting his next word from a list of choices, then... Wrong. There's something wrong with this house. Carmen's frown deepened as she rinsed the suds off her hands and arms and dried them on a towel. She turned, leaned back against the edge of the counter, and folded her arms, facing her son. He was so gaunt, so pale, with such dark gray half-moons beneath his eyes. She tried to get used to it, and, of course... She acted as if it were unnoticeable, but every time she looked at him, the physical changes in him clutched at her heart. It was as if the cobalt treatments he'd been receiving had sucked half of him away, had drained him down to a spindly porcelain doll that merely resembled her son. With those treatments had come a great deal of stress, and it was that stress to which Carmen attributed his claim about the house. That had to be it. He certainly couldn't know the truth about the house, only Carmen and her husband, Al, knew about the house's past. What do you think's wrong with the house, Stephen? She asked quietly. His smooth forehead creased, and he averted his eyes for a moment, then shrugged one shoulder and said, almost in a whisper, I don't know. It's just bad. It's... He gave a jerky shake of his head, at once agitated and frustrated. Hard to explain. It's bad. Not even sure. If we don't leave here, something bad's gonna happen to us. 
Six weeks after her birth at Harris Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, 